coach, sweet. I wish I could get a massage from a Warcraft 3 superstar. I'd go for grubby, though. I'd take a grubby massage. <laughs> that joke writes itself, though. <laughs> so, I mean, we asked about the Varus band. Already the first band coming out from Jinnah is Varus, LeBlanc and Gragas band on the, blue, on the blue side. So, these are kind of the power picks we were talking about. Will we see Chaser with the Gragas? Obviously, no. The Varus band, and now Victor as well. A lot of mid lane bands. The trends for teams are always kind of individual. Sometimes we see bot lane bands, sometimes jungle, but so far the mid lane is being shredded in the first round. Very surprising that Ku doesn't want to first pick either Gragas or Rise in this game. Expect those more to be the red side bands. Now, Victor is just, it's banned every game against Kuro. This is what people are afraid of from Kuro. Uh, he, again, was the one to really bring Victor into the competitive scene as the originator of that champion selection. He's still very strong on it, plays a ton of it in solo queue and considered a threat, but his Azir is also very good. Callista will be the final ban for the Jyn Air Green Wings, and that should be an Alistair first pick. They're gonna take that for Gorilla. Gorilla putting himself on the line, that 100% win rate, but really it's just been Gorilla's presence on the lanes. You know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but he's been the reason why the Tigers were able to pick up so many early kills against KT was how much pressure he was putting on the map. And this was even with MS disadvantages. He didn't have boots and mobility, but was still able to be across the map where he needed to be at the right time, always there for the counter gang, always there to relieve pressure in a 2v2 or 2v3 situation in the top lane. Trace and Chaser, considering their options, probably not going to see the Rengar locked in, but Rumble's been, and yeah, early power spikes from Jinnah, that seems to be the name of the game, potentially taking that away from a Ku Tigers team that's looked very comfortable on early power spike champions like the Rumble. And also, it has to be noted that Trace has played Rumble for the overwhelming majority of his games this season. He's put together a very good KDA, but it's been on a very limited champion pool, so this is just, we see it as a priority pick these days, and they are going to go towards that trend. Yeah, the statistics not necessarily supporting it. Three and three, but as you mentioned, the KDA very healthy. The Maokai is just given up and not, not locked in by Trace, despite the fact that it was both available and its highest KDA champion. Three and oh in very recent series. But look, Rumble gives you that mid-game damage pressure. It also gives you so much jungle control. Excellent lane for the Rex side to gank for. So I can kind of understand why the priorities really popped up for, Mount, for Rumble. First or second round pick, basically consistently in the last two or three weeks. That's right, and hovering over the Yasuo, please no GBM, we are done with that. Evelyn grabbed four Wisdom, and the Maokai, as you were saying, the response to the Rumble in the top lane. So Ku setting up for a very big front line right here. And GBM. it looks like they may be playing for a more late game composition this time. GBM. He's doing... GBM is so troll. He's just showing us the Faker champs. Look, if Faker can play them, why can't GBM? That's probably the question GBM wants to know <laughs> the answer to. Interestingly, he's not actually going to pick his own champion, although just cycling through, I guess, in this particular situation. Wisdom, his win rate started to pick up. I mentioned during my first cast, he was 1-4, and four, now 3-4 and four after that convincing 2 over KD Rolster. Going for early game junglers. His power in the early game is probably why they've picked him up, why he's in the lineup. And on EVE, that's about as much early pressure as you can really look for in a jungler. Oh no, the Praven may be coming back. That is always a disaster when it strikes. Blind picking <coughs> this Cassidy may not be the best decision. GBM certainly has shown Jason Ezreal in the mid lane. And Prey looking for that Lucian, a champion that he has struggled on recently. And actually, Prey is going to lock in Vein. He's throwing the playbook right out the window. He's going for the vein. Definitely not a Trinity Force, uh, at least one item power spike. Of course, some players are opting into the Trinity Force. Maybe third or fourth is picking up a phage and kind of seeing where the game is standing for them. Do they need a Black Cleaver? Do they just go for the Trinity Force for a bit more orb walking and kiting? Also, the mid lane pickup. It's again very meta. They go for the Cassiopeia. It's a blind pick, so it's available. Yeah, you just very, go for it. Very good blind pick. I am actually a bit surprised they didn't take a Zir here, which has been. While Kuro doesn't have a good record on it this season, his individual play has been good. Now, they do like to play Yasuo into the Cassiopeia, but it just hasn't looked good. I really hope this doesn't happen again. They had, they did pick up one win on it, but it wasn't because of the Yasuo, really. GBM's good at getting a lane advantage, but the closure to some of these games has been questionable at best, and KT absolutely rolled him, despite him winning the lane in that matchup.
But you just look at this lineup, the Jinnah, if they do go for this Yasuo, four melee champions, Sivir who has the 500 auto attack range, okay, good turret damage when you use the Ricochet, but so risky to take any objectives. The Siege almost non-existent, oh. and that's the complete opposite. They understand the fact that their Siege was poor. They go for the Xerath that, look, it's really fallen out of the meta in the last couple of months, and we've seen Azir versus Cassiopeia at Nauseam. What do you take on the Xerath in this comp? I think it's really bad against what the Ku Tigers are doing here because the, who are you going to be able to poke out with the Xerath in the late game? They built up such an enormous front line, and yes, GBM is an excellent, excellent Xerath player. He is the best Xerath player that we have in Korea. That is unquestionable. But he's picking it once again in a meta with the Cinder Hulk. Uh, obviously, Evan, Evelyn will be building the Warrior enchant, but in the tanky meta against Alistair, who'll be able to break his CC and get very easily into the back line right here. Lots of, there's targeted CC as well. Vayne has ways to uh, tumble out of the Xerath ultimate. I just don't see this as a very effectual pick. Jyn Air really has to do a lot of work in the early game. And Snowball is extremely hard if they're going to win this. Yeah, the only justification I can see, excellent lane against Cassiopeia, much like the Azir matchup, able to sit back once you get enough AP, maybe the Merlin Omicron, and just a bit more AP. You're instant clear, you're not really at risk of a more medium range mage like Cassiopeia, but in the late game, I completely agree with you. You set up in the back line. Is it the Maokai with the big flank? Is it just Evelyn coming in from invisibility with a flank? Does Alistair just skip past people with the headbutt pole? There's so much backline risk onto the Xerath. How will he reliably do that? damage and butts. That's right, and there's no peel either. Well, that's about it. Let's get into game one. Man, the coup fans are pretty meek today. It's a Saturday. It's the weekend. I guess, you know, maybe a late wake up. It's 5 p.m., so you'd think they'd be fully rested. GBM rocking the new Xerath skin. But I completely agree with you. He's gone for the lane matchup as far as I can tell. And look, early game power spikes their dragon control with the likes. If Xerath can set up the Rumble Rex, I Sivir, a lot of power. So if they can start monopolizing objectives, snowball can always happen. But... Yes, a late game where they don't have a big gold lead or a big objective lead where they force Ku into bad decisions. I just don't know how you execute the team fights with no. the kind of lack of synergy between the Xerath and the rest of the comp. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of choices here that probably would have been superior. <clears throat> but they are not going to be picked up here by Jin Aaron. GBM's just going to be on his own trying to dodge out the flanks in the late game, and there's just no one to peel for him. They have a Nautilus. Had this been a Thresh, may have been a bit of a different story, but it's not. And this will be, I think, quite difficult for GBM to actually use this Xerath well as the game progresses. They have to be very smart with their use of pink wards. Even if they do set up the Siege, they're going to need to pink ward all their flanks. We saw very smart moves in, uh, I believe, two days ago this series we saw where human wards were used to try and flank for the Evelyn, but pink wards obviously much more reliable. If Evelyn gets into the back line, okay, the Agony's Embrace won't necessarily stop any of Xerath's damage, but it means very reliably that both Smeb and Gorilla will be joining there in short order. Well, Prey here on the Vayne. Very interesting pickup for him. He's only played Vayne in his long career 11 times, 6 and 5 overall. And we think about Prey, we don't really think about him as a an auto-attack AD carry player, and we never have. He's never been that guy. Think about Prey, we think about Ezreal and Corky and Twitch. And now he's going to be going for that Vayne pickup. Meanwhile, Gorilla 5-0 and oh all time on Alistair, so has yet to lose a competitive game on that champion. It's a really good KDA this season as well, I believe. Around 10 KDA on the Alistair, 3-0, and oh, so it's been a very high priority pick for them. I, can't, I kind of view Prey a bit like uh, someone like Pilot, who obviously has a much shorter career in terms of top-level play, but again is more of a caster-based AD carry. Pilot 1-2 and two on the vein this season, one massive game and then some failings on that champion. Can Prey move out of his comfort zone? We talked about the Corky ban, obviously not necessary. He's opting into vein in this game. Yeah, I, I am a bit surprised about that. Prey is one of the players that I would have thought least likely to make a decision to go into the vein and 
again, his positioning on some of these shorter range AD carries like Siver has been somewhat of an issue. So with Vayne, how's that gonna work? There's a flash going in right now. Trace is bounced out of the fight. Smeb also there in the top lane. First blood for Vayne. And that answers that, the lane swap. All of a sudden, everyone showing up. Captain Jack going to respond by fast pushing. And Ku, look, they initiate the lane swap. You can tell by sending their bot lane to the top lane, then really smart with the jungle follow. So four members, including the flash, expended by Alistair to pick up first, but it was very good pathing from the jungle and top lane duo, and gets them a nice advantage in the vein rolling. Yeah, and right now, too, they knew that Chaser was on the top side of the map taking his red, so that enables Smep just to immediately TP to the lane. Tracer's TP is down, so this is a really good start for Smeb. Assist, keeping his TP uh, up until he can actually use it to immediately respond to the laning phase. Now, Koo just gonna camp this. Oh, boy. Yeah, Allison, not quite in range for the head, but I agree, in most scenarios, you can't teleport to that bot lane from threat of being dived from a clumped minion wave, but having that extra information allows him to teleport to bot, pick up the much needed farm. Smeb doesn't lose much and gets that kill and experience advantage. It was a lot of experience too. It was a very large wave in the bottom side. It's translated to a level edge for Smeb right now. So everything going the Koo Tigers way. And I love to see this from the Tigers because when we look at them as a team, when we talk about their big run last season and their strengths, their mid-game side wave control, their team fighting, their shot calling in the late game has all been top tier. It has dug them out of numerous deficits, of numerous holes, but it's been their early game where they have to find themselves in that hole in the first place, where they constantly have to play from five, eight K behind as Kuro right here, Chaser under the tower. That's gonna be some nice poke. And not a dead Cassiopeia, the turnaround. Wisdom comes in to deny that one. GBM no ult yet to finish off that kill and Chaser pays for it. Very aggressive to go for an engage with that on a champion that relies on hitting those line skill shots like GBM on this Zerath. Wisdom is in the right place at the right time. Trying to equalize some pressure by getting some pressure onto the mid lane by picking up a kill now increases the early game snowball. Things looking great for Koo. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is just going to help them even more in terms of scaling into that late game. And here's a question that's going to be answered. Can Koo hold off and make the right decisions when they're not playing around early dragons, early power spikes, because they can't now? Vayne, Cassiopeia, Maokai, they need items, they need levels, they need time in order to work. Exactly, they haven't opted into the likes of their corky rumble combinations that just monopolize early dragon control. It's something different from Ku, but Ku again, rocked KT Rolster in their previous series, now showing something different. They've got that mechanical skill from playing all that solo queue, now also with the very smart early game strategies to complement what was always traditionally a strong late game. They're setting themselves up for success and they're playing the long game and just developing their style rather than just relying on the sign of the virus corky that we saw in their previous series. Yeah, and again, you have to wonder about this Jyn Air team who continues to rely on somewhat gimmick picks or, or picks with very limited usefulness in terms of their timing or in terms of the fact that you have to create a big snowball for them to be very effective. Uh, just not playing a, a really conservative style that lends itself to a lot of versatility. The Yasuo has been a problem this season. The Varus Vein combo has been a problem for them this season. And now the Zareth making a return, a pick that Jenner, after seeing so much success with it early in the spring when Zareth was a strong pick, just can't get rid of. They can't let it go. Who uh, have shown there are ways to beat? Uh, these early power, uh, to beat uh, late game power spike comps, like, ironically the one they're running here, you can beat a team like the Cassiopeia Vein, where there's a lot of backline damage with even this low dive, because remember, Jyn don't really have anyone that can pull off the flanks that we're threatening uh, the, the, the Zerath within the late game. We talked about how Maokai, Evelyn, Alistair, all gonna be the case of the Zerath. When we're talking about Vein damage with Cassiopeia denying any sort of backline threat with the Petrifying Gaze, there's no Hecarims. There's only the Rumble to lay down damage and no other true backline threat. So if you monopolize the Dragon, maybe you can get things done if you're Jyn'Air, but it's so risky. It's so uh, execution focused, which we've criticized Ku for picking, and now it's Jyn'Air that's more on that side. Yeah. Definitely Wisdom will be seen by the Tremor Sense right here. They want to set up for this Dragon. They push Captain Jack out of lane. Smeb doing that by himself, actually. 
And that's going to mean this Dragon not really an option to contest by Jin Air unless they really want to go all in for it. But Captain Jack just has to take a breather, head back to the fountain, and Dragon number one all ready for Ku. And the number of ways that Jin Air can actually win this game are dwindling dramatically considering they need that early Dragon control to force out the poke that they have on their composition. Them not taking it means that Ku has a lot more wiggle room as Wisdom just goes on to GBM, gets stunned actually. The fast feet from Wisdom. One oh, more still. Nice Dash forward for the Q. Arcano Pulse claims a victim as GBM really commits to that one and gets double buffs after it. This is why GBM is very dangerous on this champion. We've heard all these stories from GBM talking in some of the shows here on OGN about how with his Zareth, he individually studies his opponents. He looks at film, he notices their tendencies and memorizes them. Which way do they juke? How do they juke skill shots? And that's one of the factors that's made his Zareth ultimate so damn accurate. Two out of three right there, and then the follow-up flash cue. And the last player to make bold claims like that was, of course, Madlife on his Blitzcrank, who always talked about watching tape to pick up the tendencies. Applying that to a champion like Zareth can help you in the laning phase. We speculate that's a pretty good lane. He's overtaking it, 10 CS up, and now also picking up the kill. But just internalize this, Monte Cristo. A team comp with Rumble, Rek'Sai, Sivir, even talking about the Zareth in the early game, couldn't afford, had to opt out of fighting the first dragon. That's already a bit panic stations when we talk about wind conditions coming into late. Yeah, absolutely. Now they're going to try and take this blue buff away. Chaser forces the flash out of Kuro. Equalizer goes out. Wisdom caught between a barbecue and some lightning. And that'll be his end right there in the jungle. So good movement by Tracer on the map. Smeb still wants to contest this right here. They want another blue buff for GBM. They're calling over Chase. Now it's going to re-leash. Of course, the 10 leashes, I believe, have been maxed out. Smeb's going to poke around. Will he be able to pick it up? No, of course, won't be able to with the high base damage on the Q from Zareth. So look, these, this is the fights they're contesting for. They chose to give up the first dragon, but then kind of gifted and engaged onto Wisdom after he was just too aggressive in lane. Showed himself on Evelyn when there was no real need to, and now roasted, as you mentioned, by the rumble on the blue invade. Wisdom's kind of just being too aggressive, too alpha, and paying for it. Right, and in spite of that, Jyn is still going to be behind in gold here, so the Tigers still going to be comfortable in this situation. And we can talk about GBM Zareth individually, even when Cinder Hulk hit the tank meta came through. We oftentimes see when he picks Zareth, he'll do very well on his own in a game, but when it comes to the ability to make an impact in the mid and late game, this Zareth is so difficult to use right now. We've seen Jin Air lose games with Zareth where GBM doesn't even die, and he certainly is great at this champion. It's just about its effectiveness right now and the differences that came out once we have all these big tank items, big tank junglers, even Kuro getting the Abyssal Scepter first, somewhat of a new build. It's Rose with Cinderhulk. And look, lane phase, we expected to do well, maybe not as well as it just was pulled off, you know, to have a 20 CS advantage, of course. Most off the back of the kill, this is gonna be a really aggressive engage. There's a twisted advance. Do they have enough damage to take, take down Trace? He's not doing any damage to them, but Wisdom, after the two deaths, he doesn't have that extra health. He's not tanky enough, and they have to back away. Yeah, they do, but they still maintain the control of that lane. A couple pots still for Trace, be able to heal up somewhat. But you can go for another gank right here if you want. Looks like Wisdom is just going to leave the lane. Smeb trying to pull some tricks and hide right here, see if he can convince Trace that he has actually recalled. The identity of this lane between Rumble and Maokai in terms of who wins has always been a bit questioned. It feels like if with no jungle influence, Rumble often runs away with the lead, but Chase is going to come in. There's no equalizer. They don't realistically have the damage takedown. Catalyst, Matt, they're doing a lot, though. Well, he didn't pop his ult until pretty late right there. Meanwhile, Jack forced to use on the hunt and heal and flash to get out of some shenanigans. Gorilla burning his flash, so it looks like he just got flash pulled. And now the issue, this is what happens when we talk about Vayne versus Siva. Blade the Rune King already completed by Prey. The kill pressure is immense in that situation. Just the Blade the Rune King being blown, both summoners and the ultimate being used by Captain Jack. Suddenly, Jack can only really hope to wave clear from distance with the Q and then have to move away from lane because the solo kill pressure from Prey onto Siva is very high. Look at how the top lane's been going too. Smeb 
really opening up a very large CS lead. And a lot of that's coming from the fact that he got that big advantage because of the gank early on and then his ability to teleport and collect that wave. So he's maintaining a pretty large lead. And, you know, that's, that's probably all of the gold is the difference, the overall gold, rather, is the difference between Smeb and Trace right now. And that is huge when we're talking about a very bursty team composition like Jin Air and the Maokai being pretty darn fed already. And 40 CS advantage, and I, I was mentioning it before, traditionally with no, if you just, you know, 1v1, no junglers involved, Rumble should win this lane. Junglers becoming involved, getting that snowball catalyst suddenly, no real solo crow kill pressure coming through from the Rumble. You can run away with this lane if you're Smurf. He's able to do that, he's been able to do that traditionally on many champions like the Nah. And look, Equalizer Centric will be the build coming out from Trace. That's what we're expecting regardless. So there still is the potential that the very low item floor from Rumble could be relevant in the fight, but we're talking about perfect execution on multiple members. And not only that, Dragon's up now. Trace's TP is down. Smebs is up. This is another really good time for Ku to make a play onto a Dragon here. And they're going to walk right over to it as Kuro starts to push up. See if Wisdom's going to get down into that Dragon Pit anytime soon. They certainly have an opportunity for a 4v5 right here. Wisdom's on the top side of the map. They haven't prepped Vision around. In fact, there's a couple of pink wards available. At least one notable pink ward available. Chaser is face checked by Smed. They get a lot of damage. Equalizer used. Yeah, he's going to try and back out right there. There's the Harpoon. Arcane Smash knocks him back, but Smeb in a lot of trouble as the Xerathold comes in. Flash and Paralyzing Gaze doesn't actually find a target. Smeb going back in with his W. Heals because of his passive before going down, but Kuro's going to clean this up. Double kill for Cassiopeia. Insane that Smeb lived as long as he didn't actually won that engage after basically being free hit for about 70% of his health. Really nice Maokai mechanics coming through. During all of this, though, Captain Gag Jack gets free time with the bot lane and takes down the turret. Yeah, and GBM going to be able to clear here from a long range, eliminating the threat of that dive. He has that blue buff, so better use of Ku's time to go take a look at this dragon right now. It's like Kuro's just going to stay in the mid lane, however. Gorilla with a recall. And they may back off and actually lose this objective. Definitely could have gone for the straight for the dragon instead. Still really impressive play. GBM has a lot of AP. He was involved in that engage mostly just from the ultimate, but still has full mana because he already had blue buff. Freshly shot with an initial large rod, so he can just walk around. They will have the immediate dragon control. There are wards available for Smeb. He doesn't have home guard boots, and he's already committed to the top lane. Won't have wave control either. Jin Air want this first answering dragon, and they have the most immediate pressure. They should be able to rush it down. Ping's doesn't look going like down. Test. Looks like there will be a contest here. Gorilla looking for a flank right here. There's the hook onto him. Ziverolt is blown, but so is Gorilla's. And now Prey gets an auto onto Chaser. Wisdom taking position, and everyone from Janera retreating into the choke where they can use that Zerith poke. Chaser condemned into the wall, and that's going to be a dragon picked up actually by Prey right there. Wisdom didn't even have his smite up for that fight. Gorilla playing Dance Dance Revolution, but can't quite make it through. Prey not going to make a flash over that wall in order to follow up the kill, and they know Wisdom's in there. Tremor Sense has seen him. It's just a ward and a Prey Seeker into the brush, so we'll see if Ku can convert this into anything else. Wow, Jin Air gave up ground immediately on that objective, and Jin Air trying to draw them into the choke with the, like with the Equalizer, with the Xerath, but it didn't really work. Prey, Prey and the rest of the Ku Tigers didn't fall for the trap. If the dragon hadn't been leashed, if it wasn't already at about 2,500 health, maybe you could bait them into walking to the train. So I don't mind the shot calling on either side. Wisdom tries to take down the red buff, doesn't have any immediate help, so Chaser will just back away. I like the shot calling first from Jin to understand, okay, let's get them in this choke, actually use the Rumble Equalizer with the double magic penetration items. But Ku, they looked at that dragon health, 1,500. Someone made that clear call, just rush it down. And of course, then Jin Air were just completely out of position with the free objective. Equalizer only really used for a hope to zone. Both teams with clear ideas of what to do. Ku, I think, understand their more immediate power and their positioning advantage as the fight develops. Right. And if you're Jin Air, I think that you don't, not only because of what happened, you don't start the dragon, but because you want to get that poke in anyway. So why start the objective when you really just want to have a nice 
dance around that dragon for an extended period of time, force them to recall and then take it safely. So I think Jin Air not really playing to their strengths. They thought maybe they had that timing window, but I think it's better to be safe than sorry. Just go ahead, get the ward advantage, wait for the Ku Tigers to show up. They were just rushing in too because they were late to the they were late to the pit. So I don't have a lot of experience with basketball. I'm gonna use a basketball analogy. So I might just completely <laughs> face plan on this one. But it feels like rushing down the dragon for this Jin Air comp, just with the champions they chose, was a pretty low percentage play, a low percentage shot that they took. And then because they committed to that, Ku just made the clear call and took down the second dragon. So now Dragon emerges as a win condition to already taken the first 18 minutes. I don't think I think I nailed the NBA thing. I got that. I got the basketball. <laughs> Did you nail the the NBA thing? Are you going to go over there? Is, is that? Have you been watching the NBA finals? I know that it, they're happening. So I know that the <laughs> Golden State Warriors are in them. Am I doing all right so yeah. far? Yeah. All right. Who's the other team? <laughs> I'm Australian. Come on, mate. I'm saying mate. Too. You, you do realize that there's a very famous Australian player on the other team that all of Australia is like really hyped about right now. So everyone on the hates team, me during the this team, conversation. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get out there. You're, you could claim you're Australian, but actually this is probably the most relevant basketball team to Australia. I don't know anything about basketball, Monte Cristo. <laughs> low percentage shot. I should have just made an NFL line. I know nothing about that as well, but there's a low percentage play there too. All right, well, Kuro. Not using his ult right there, but not actually catching GBM. GBM flashing and cleansing out of it, however. And now Jenner really wants this outer turret in the top side. Chaser is sitting in a ward. Jenner's only real hope right now is to kind of run them around the map with that extra turret damage. Kuro's taken a lot of poke. Actually commits to the ultimate. It's not going to be enough damage with just a couple of bolts coming through. Chaser has to back away, so no kill pressure. Although Gorilla, not quite in range of a headbutt bolt. No, but Gorilla. Just chasing Jin Air around the map this game. You can see how bold he is on this champion. He wants that six game Alistair undefeated win streak. That's bold and there's committing to the wow. distortion boots early. Now he's gonna of course pop the ultimate. They're trying to get Trace next to a wall for prey. They seem distracted between taking down this turret and fighting and Gorilla's taking a lot of damage. And there's the ultimates coming in from Nautilus and Rumble and that'll be Trace with the kill onto Alistair Prey. Ults into the back line. He wants to get some of these single targets down. Smeb on the outside finds GBM, tries to sidestep the Q, goes down anyway and the Ku Tigers in a bit of a rough state around this uh, tower right Still now. Cassiopeia is coming up and that means Jyn is going to have to back off. They see Kuro has left the mid lane, and Kuro going to get some free jungle camps and tower pressure in mid. And in spite of all that, Ku maintain their position on this very low top lane turret. So Kuro had fallen low. We saw the engage onto him after GBM missed the ultimate around. Decide to stay in lane, just use his passive uh, to heal up a little bit. Wow, Wisdom takes a lot of damage. The ult's available again. Two bolts has to flash. Third one goes wide. GBM. You can t see that his confidence is up. It's probably what he's been practicing. But if we see the replay, Gorilla takes a lot of damage for free, and Prey isn't committing to this engage. No, he's not. Wants to get that turret down instead. Smeb right now on the outside. Gorilla, everyone splits off, so they're not actually knocked up. But his ult falls off right while the equalizer goes down. Jyn Air with a very decisive engage. Locks Smeb up. Smeb does get a kill onto Rek'Sai. And now we're going to look at the top side of this fight. Pretty late ultimate there from Evelyn, actually. Wisdom not doing much with that after everyone's already so low. And then uh, Jyn Air holding on to the turret for now. And I can understand the game plan from Jyn Air. They recognize, that, okay, they've got a vein. They've got Cassiopeia who has decent wave clear, but no real immediate wave clear like, for example, Sivir's kit will provide, Zerath's kit will provide in general. The wave clear on Jyn Air's side is massive. So even in the late game, they should have a lot of stall tactics. Now, necessarily, are there team fights that Jyn Air win? It's possible. We've already talked about the fact that Team Comp has pretty low risk in terms of actually being able to get onto the vein in the late game. But if you pull it out long enough, a lot of teams have shown this. Even Katie Rolster in that series against LZIM. One mistake late game. They're certainly able to turtle with this comp. And not only that, but if they catch somebody out with the poke and they get a Baron, their siege is going to be absolutely ridiculous. It will be unstoppable pretty much from the Ku Tigers unless they can get a big Evelyn Maokai flank in. So there's that aspect to consider as well. As long as Jyn Air does a good job of clearing out the wards from possible engage positions and pink warding their flanks, they could take it. But it, they have to get that perfect poke off 
to get an objective, and that is going to be challenging. They also just can't leave Vision off this Baron for even a second right now. Cassiopeia, Vayne, this is going to kill the Baron nearly instantly for the Ku Tigers, and they can tank it with the Alistair ultimate, so they can come out of a fight as well at nearly full HP, even this early in the game. Entirety of the goal, it basically rely, is relying on Smeb. Equalizer only build comes through from Trace, it's necessitated by the fact that he has less gold. No threat of picking up Azonias and even being able to sort of dive onto the Vayne. What this translates to me, Monte Cristo, is that Prey should be able to free hit most of these fights. There's just no real way to do damage, barring GBM focusing him out in a fight, and that's going to be difficult and very hard to perform. Who should try and trade this dragon for a Baron if they can? They can certainly do it in the time frame that Jyn Air can do the dragon. And they have, they're starting to clear out wards around the pit, so Jyn Air not really able to commit to a dragon right now, and they should be so scared of this. The objective going down. So with that, they bait him to the other side of the map, make a rush at the Dragon. Everyone on Jyn Air is scrambling to get there right now. Sivir will be last, and that's going to be a drag. There's nothing they can do. Yeah, you can see so much zoning potential from the Maokai and Alistair in the front. Very good positioning from them. That's three Dragons now that have Rumble come put down. It's a really nice equalizer splitting up the threats. Once again, Gorilla's left his own devices, and Vayne is not grouped. Yeah, he, she is now Break coming in. From the rear, Smeb starts the engage. Chaser caught out in the front line. Prey starting to dive through the composition. Trace not able to get much on the outside. Prey turns around after picking up another kill onto Che. They don't want to commit to this anymore. Push up the mid lane instead is going to be their action. And will they go for this Baron? Chaser's not here, they have 15 seconds. Looks like they just want to take a red buff and recall. The big factor is no blue buff available on Crow. It just expired, so very, very risky to DPS down that Baron. Okay, a lot of single target DPS onto a neutral from Cassiopeia, but without the blue, you just can't peel away. And take a look, we do see the Rylai's for Kuro right here, giving him some extra tankiness. That's so good against the burst from Jyn Air. And not only that, but gives Prey so much more room to maneuver than he already has. This is such an easy game to play Vayne in. So when you finish Rylai's and your Seraphs, which is already available, is fully charged, you're talking about effectively 2,500 health for this Cassiopeia. He already has Abyssal Scepter, so Magic is just gonna be very, working very well with the shield and the flat health you've picked up. What this allows him to do, just to be so much more aggressive with that position. If you go a full AP build, say, the Seraph's Embrace into the Death Cap, you're just going to be exploded by GBM, even if only a couple of his skill shots hit. Can be so much more aggressive. And we saw in the previous fight, Prey, free hitting for the vast majority of the fight. It's only an item like Zonya's on Rumble or a big miss position from Prey, which, okay, he's done a couple of times this season, but with such low threat, he should be able to run wild in these fights. I also love the fact that there's a distortion enchantment already because Kuro, there's such a squishy composition from Jyn Air. He just needs that one flash ult to absolutely shut down all the damage threats from Jyn Air. So a fast, he knows his place this game. And Cassiopeia, sure, does a lot of damage, has a lot of versatility and builds. Is super dangerous with that Luden's Echo, but he doesn't have to provide it. Instead, his sustained crowd control with the Rylai's, uh, his frequency of being able to use that petrifying gaze with a flash onto the back line, much more valuable for the Tigers. All they have is GBM pulling off miracles on Zareth, and at 3-0 and 2, working towards a Void stuff, he still has instant kill pressure on these squishy members like the Vayne. If he can account for the Vayne, he's the only one truly with backline threat, which sounds comical, but given just his long range, only some miracle play will, will be a, they be able to take down Vayne. And there's so many win conditions being stacked by Ku. They have the three dragons. They have the Baron threat, like you mentioned. We're looking for miracles from Jeanette. Absolutely. And now those miracles are going to be dwindling too as Prey gets more magic resist. The Aegis has been done for quite some time. From the Ku Tigers, that early build, going to be doing a lot of work. And, and this is another game where we see how good GBM is at Zareth. He's had a very good game on Zareth, but it's also why Zareth is not a meta pick right now. And we've seen, when I was in the L watching the LPL, very similar games where you pick that Zareth for lane, but just doesn't translate in team fights. whether it's the big dive like Maokai Hecarim. They're doing a lot of damage to this Baron. Only now is their vision. 
Uh, seeing the teleport coming in from Malka, we still don't see him on our screen. In the back line, onto Chaser. Chaser taking a lot of damage. Prey is at no risk whatsoever, but GBN's trying to kite back. And look at this too. Prey gets the isolated target on the side. Kuro and Wisdom now coming through the opposite choke. Smeb wants this. They're all in the line, but Trace solo will get picked off eventually. Kuro trying to dodge right here. There's the ultimate, and they will barely not kill Prey. Flash. Boomerang Blade won't finish him off. Smeb left on his own, but he's gonna take down Che pretty easily, and I'm not sure they're gonna actually be able to kill Smeb right here, as Smeb dances around all these skill shots. Gorilla on the other side of the wall does come in, thrown right next to Wisdom. Gorilla with the flash play to get the kill onto Jack. But just an insane fight, it went on for so long. Excellent kiting back by Jinnah. I didn't even know they had the venues to do so. Now Trace is comically out of position. GBM is close though. The poison registers. Kuro knows he's here. And we're waiting to see what will happen. Wisdom is low. Trace doesn't have the scrap shield available. Is taken down. And that's really, probably... Really nice play. I mean, GBM had to use his skill shot onto the Cassiopeia when he could have killed Wisdom. But Wisdom had the damage to come in and follow it during GBM's cooldown. So nice hunt on a difficult situation from Jyn Air. And Jyn Air's play around terrain has been super impressive. Watch this. This is the key to this fight right here. Gorilla and Wisdom are going to clog the choke where the rumble is, while Smeb and Prey are going to go to work onto Chaser on the side. Look at that first kill. Jyn Air not really able to do anything besides drop a rumble ultimate as they follow up. But they're able to kite back. This is what they tried to do around Dragon. Finally, Ku does take the bait, and you can see the chunks coming through from this earth, a massive, watch the size up here. The first one registered, there could have been a potential double kill, but smart of Ku to move in opposite directions. Captain Jack goes for the flash, hopes to get the kill. They eventually take down Smear, but I like the fact that Jyn at least reacted well, tried to use what they have, which is strong damage around terrain and short ranges on Ku. It just wasn't quite enough. That's right, once they saw them be themselves being split up and the danger that Vayne presented, they started to pull back, regroup into a choke point, and that was very nearly a big Jyn Air win. Even Jack with the Flash Boomerang Blade could have picked up a double. Three members of the Ku Tigers at such low health could have gone really either way. That's why we're excited that even though Ku seemed to have outpicked them, at least in terms of how the team comp stack up and played the early game well, execution heavy is something we leveled a lot of teams. This rumble has gone full execution. It's literally Leandri's into voice up. It's hit that equalizer or being relatively useless. That's right. Well, they're coming in right now. Fourth dragon of the game, again picked up by Prey. Smeb just going to back off after blowing the Righteous Glory. Who knows? They don't have to fight right now. They don't want to play a game where they just get drawn into more of these choke points and poked. That's all Jyn Air can do is look for a fight and a choke. But by the time that happens, we might be talking about a fifth dragon. We might be talking about a Baron buff being picked up. That is immediate risk clumping up around the Baron with all the magic damage from both Zerith and Rumble raining down the Equalizer. But this is the only area that Jyn can fight around. So if they're just smart, disengage from that Baron and look for a fight away from a choke, Ku should take this. And the side wave control, one of the things we brought up about Ku, the side waves once again bearing down on their enemies' turrets. Really good preparation of the minions to maximize the pressure at this Baron. Yeah, you can see in the top lane, very nice minion wave. We'll push in in about 40 seconds to a minute's time. They're going to wait to see who shows up on the map. Captain Jack has to use his pink wall just to get any hope of vision in this particular area. They're still not responding to those waves. Look at the timing. Rek'Sai in the bottom side, massive minion wave in the top lane. Such a good position to do this Baron from GBM. Will get found out by a sapling. Now Gorilla healing up his teammates, taking a little bit of poke damage, but that's going to be a Baron because of the map play there. And now the fight's going to start. Smeb onto Captain Jack. Captain Jack in the front line just gets chain CC'd as he's knocked around by Gorilla's Alistair. Kuro finds Che all alone on the side. And there are that skirmish pickups that Jyn Air really didn't want to see come through. But now Ku Tiger is just going to power down the mid lane. And they may get that top tier two as well, just due to that side wave. Just executed perfectly, Monte Cristo. I know you love the side waves. Both of us do, but they've prepped everything. And Beautiful. Jyn Air was in a lose-lose situation. Do they react to these waves and lose Baron? Do they eventually try to fight after you've been chunked out by the Baron? Oh no, you're fighting in this open area. The Equalizer only really delays Prey getting to the fight. Jack falls down first, the Inhibitor falls down from Jyn Air. This Ku Tigers, they were absent for the first, what, four or five series they played this season, but suddenly they've 
filled those strategic holes. They've sharpened those mechanics and really been strong, or at least even in the laning phase. And this late game coup team fighting identity is just coming out more and more. And their shot calling is just so on point. The way they prepare three minutes ahead, this is their ability that we've seen to come back from deficits. And it's magnified even more when they have that early game advantage. And not only that, they've gone away from that big, like, poke style, the big Trinity Force power spike or tier power st spike style, uh, and gone for two late game carries and a big late game tank, and they're pulling it off. And the acid test, just talking to you pregame for you, was can they win without the Corkies? Can they win without the Rumbles of the world? And the answer here, I mean, Vayne just about as far away from Corky in terms of AD carry identity as you can be, going for that auto attack base, Silver Bolts proccing AD carry over the Corky. Captain Jack's caught out now. He's famously strong at those spell shield mechanics. Will get away in this situation, but it's just another minion way that Smeb's going to be prepping for the siege to continue. That's right. And there's still super minions that Jenner is going to have to deal with here in the mid lane. Everyone's starting to pile up on the side. Minion wave, it looks like it will be slowly pushing towards the tier one of the Koo Tigers, but that should be cleared out by the turret. It isn't too big at this point. I don't think they're gonna send anybody into the top side for that one. Just keep up with this siege. And as fantastic as the wave clear of Jin Air is when they have to send someone into the mid lane, it's a lot more dangerous. And the, the dive potential here is huge from Koo as well. It's interesting they sent Wisdom to be the one to threaten the turret dive. Now, of course, I would have sent sin. Gorilla. Exactly, you can be sinned by the Rek'Sai Tremor since you don't have the, quite the same scariness. They're getting a lot of damage onto this inhibitor turret. Smeb takes free damage, hoping for prey in the short range vein to get the turret. They get it, and we should see an engage. And there goes Gorilla, double knock up. Trace goes down nearly immediately gets obliterated by Kuro. Kuro with the double kill, just moving on through the composition, and that is going to be a turret, and more than likely a game win. Prey low, but not low enough to actually prevent him from attacking these objectives. Gets a little bit of life steal. There is going to go the Nexus, the Koo Tigers, with a very measured, convincing game one win against the Jenner Green Wings. We talked about GBM on this earth, did not die during that game 3-0 and 4, but predictably with the backline threat of the Maokai, of the Evelyn, even the flash engages from Kuro on the Cassiopeia, just zoned out of doing damage. 7 out of 8 kill participation, but Zareth did well in lane, but just could not get it done in team fights. Well, I, I, you know, I know how this story goes. I, I said it perfectly. It's another great game from GBM Zareth. It's another game where they lose, where he doesn't die. His positioning is good, his laning is good, everything about it is great. But it just does not function well in this meta. It's too limited, your timing window is too small, and he just couldn't put up enough of a defense to actually take objectives or be a major threat in this game. I don't think it's any surprise that Kuzan playing very much the meta champions. Cassio, Azir, LeBlanc, and uh, Lissandra. To it. That's right. Where did where did the gladiatorial games go? That's what I want. Now I have to get all my blood and violence digitally, Papa Smithy. Jeanette, they're the ones that are gonna to want to be avoiding the bloodletting and the violence this game as they just look they honestly they kind of picked themselves into a corner. There wasn't really very much they could do when it came to trying to shut down a hyper carry like Vayne when they had such low backline threat. They're sticking with the same sort of bands, though it's it's Kuro focused once again. Varus and Victor, the first bans from Jeanette. Yeah, Kalista has to be banned out this time by the Koo Tigers, so at least that'll free up a ban here for Jeanette now that they're on the blue side. What is it going to be? LeBlanc, Rise, Gragas, still up. Rise, still up. All bans in the last game. This time, Koo really changing up their strategy. Worth knowing that Koo were the ones that banned Rise on the blue side last game, so maybe just Smep not want to take that champion. They do ban it away here, so obviously Trace been practicing that in solo queue. There's a lot up. Uh, I think that they saw, they let Rise through for KT, Koo Tigers, and they did shut it down with that rumble, but the fact that someday nearly killed Smeb's 2-0 and 2 Abyssal Scepter rumble at eight minutes probably gave them a bit of pause about is this likely to happen again, and do we want to take that risk? Wouldn't think they needed too much more free information on the power <laughs> of Rise on patch 5.10, but yes, highlight worthy clip, and just really, just kind of summarize how strong Rise is on this patch, and moving into 5.11, so I see you've seen plenty of Rise bans, and it does free up champions to come through. There's quite a lot that escapes the picks and bans. A lot of mid lane bans last game, only the two this time around, so LeBlanc, notably, is available in the pool.
Yeah, will Kuro go for it? I think he has to take it right here. GBM also a very good LeBlanc player. Maokai and the LeBlanc picked up for Ku. Very confident in Smeb's ability on that champion. And with his MVP performance, who can blame him? Rek'Sai, Chaser's kind of go-to jungler these days. Grab first, again, Chaser, a player who really can make very strong plays early on the map, start to snowball his lanes. Great ganker. Didn't have a lot of luck last time on the champion, especially that early gank where his team uh, dropped the ball a little bit. Surprising to see, though, with Sejuani available, and again, a very good record in that champion this season, Still not looking to engineer a comp for the Sejuani to work. Going back to the Rek'Sai side, despite not having that big undefeated record on the champion, such as the priority. Picking up uh, LeBlanc, and of course, one of the strongest champions at dealing with LeBlanc, as EDG showed back at MSI, the Maokai, is a really nice two first fix, especially with Alistair not available in the pool. And the Sivir with the Spell Shield will be the response. And Rumble once more for Jin Air. I mean, they've got three of the same five picks they had last game. Difference is, how are they going to blind pick this mid lane with perhaps the Ezreal coming up right there? A lot of poke, actually. Perhaps for the Ku Tigers, Corky would be perfectly serviceable here as well. I like the fact that there's real identity to the picks. Of course, Jinnah go with a very strong early game jungler. LeBlanc is the answering pick and the champion that deals with LeBlanc. And then Siva actually has a lot of synergy against the Rumble. When you have Siva, you can just pop on the hunt so much harder to get those extra ticks of damage. So kind of equalizing picks on both sides. Evelyn, so going once again for the early game. It worked last time and honestly, a lot of similarity from Ku. Yeah, the only pick they've changed out so far is that LeBlanc for the Cassiopeia. And then again, we're looking at two very heavy damage mages in that mid lane. and. LeBlanc also going to be able to do a lot of work with a strong front line when she has that protection to pop back behind. Also really good flank threat from LeBlanc as well as Evelyn and Maokai. So uh, even a better pick comp than they had last game as well as some pretty good team fighting capabilities. They may want to lock down with this Annie here, but running Lulu is another very early game focused composition, very SK Telecom-esque. The Lulu Sivir combination for that speed, for that pick capability, but I don't really know if you're gonna be able to make that many picks against the Ku Tigers. You really have to focus out this vein. Once again, it's gonna be a comp that's focused around objective control, which they failed at last game. They needed to control objectives with the Rumble, fell behind in lane, then could never get in with the Dragon Race. They go for the Lulu. Actually a 27 KDA 2-0 for GBM this season. And of course, traditionally, we all remember his, I believe, 1,000 AP game on Lulu. He's a very good Lulu player, but Lulu Siva, very execution heavy, very early game focused to the comp. Gorilla returns to the Karma, which we saw wonderful things from last game. They're all in on objectives again, Monte Cristo. That's right. And this kind of composition, the Lulu Siva combination with a very heavy pick support like Annie, the only team that has impressed me with this is SK Telecom because it's very finicky. It's, it all depends on your vision, your ability to show up at Dragon first, and then as everyone is char starting on the enemy team to come to that objective, uh, just running to one flank and quickly killing somebody and then taking the objective afterwards because you, you just can't fight 5v5 with this composition. And now that we see Gorilla's Karma coming back in, there's a lot of shields, a lot of boosts. This 5v5 from the Ku Tigers is going to be much, much stronger come the late game. So Jinera, like you said, they have that priority in the mid game. They need to make some sort of play, but I'm just not, th I don't know if they're gonna be able to do it after what they saw in the last one. I guess the big question, we'll learn more about this Karma pick. Will the speed from the shielding be enough, the Mantra E be enough to disengage from Siva Lulu, potential any initiation coming through? They've got to stack the speed on the side of Jin Air, Siva Ultimate, Lulu Whimsy. We're still learning about the new Karma on patch 5.10 and Gorilla made us a believer with game one. It's a different identity here. It's not so much more about laning, it's about that speed. Well, let's get into the game, see if Jin Air can execute this time or well, whether Ku can last him out.
Jader Vance out in force today. Lots of win in the sales despite losing that first game. So it's good to see that the fans are still here. No fair weather fans at this young Stammy no Sports Stadium. No one would ever actually accuse a Jidair fan of being fair weather. The weather's never Bobby really Smithy. gone that way, has it? <laughs> no one would ever say that. Uh, actually, one of the few organizations in Korea that hasn't won a season here. I am as well. Well, yes, the long-suffering I am. Bring them into this. I don't think Jidair really wants to be conflated with I am. They have been doing better recently, of sure. course. Jidair Stealth's really picking it up towards the end of last year, and then Jenner for most of the season in spring up until Cinder Hulk being a major threat. I have to think this game is all about Chaser. Chaser's the one that we singled out during uh, the pregame. Of course, 500 MVP points, been a very large contributor for his team on an early pressure jungler. Couldn't make it happen last game, last game but he has these kind of tenuous lanes. We already talked about Rumble Maokai. Smep had a 40 to 50 CS advantage in lane after early gang pressure from Wizen on this same Evelyn. We're seeing the same top half of the map, actually. Rumble, Rek'Sai against the Maokai Evelyn. And can something change? It feels like it's very jungler focused and chases the man that's really been leading Jhene when they have picked up their wins. Absolutely. And this Vayne Karma lane, not really sold by this one. A bit of a mismatch. Usually we see that support Karma uh, come in when there is a poking AD carry for more synergy. And we saw Gorilla, he's gonna be the first player that I know of to play this support karma um, since the big karma changes that did make her very powerful. You know, Papa, you and I were talking about this support karma before the game today, Whoa. and Trace gonna get close to dying at those wolves, but let's talk about new karma. Okay. You, wanna, you wanna chat about her because a lot of people may not know some of the changes that were made and why she is now suddenly better in the support role. So basically, they shifted her away from having, I mean, Karma originally, when, with her original kit, was all about being a solo lane champion. People would try her in the support role, but didn't really have the kit for it. And really this rework, the latest iteration is to basically remove damage from all abilities apart from the Q. The Q still hits like a truck. Everyone remembers walking to lane in a 2v2 lane and Karma doing, what, 50% of your health with a Mantra Q. That hasn't changed, but basically all damage removed from the shield and a lot more utility focus. W still does damage as Wisdom. She smites away the, uh, the Scuttle Crab there to pick up Vision. The root, the, basically the Mantra root and the Mantra uh, shield are where the big changes have come. The shield has a 420 base value at highest level, which is massive. The highest base shield in the whole game, even higher than, of course, the shield that uh, Echo has, that, of course, a lot of people have raised their ire at. And the, the base root, uh, the amount of CC that they have on that W, Mantra W at highest level, 3.25 seconds CC. Longer than a Morgana binding. Yeah, it's a huge CC, and Captain Jack not quite getting the worst end of it right there. And it is worth noting that Gorilla at his last game wasn't prioritizing that shield, but it is an option. And come the ultra late game, it is another protective ability to help prey out and is incredibly strong, even with very little AP. So the lane we saw Gorilla play this in was Corky and Karma, which of course is a lane it makes bullying more sense. lane. But it yeah. was also in a lane swap in that situation. So you walk bottom lane with one of the lowest pressure laners, you know, someone who needs a bit of babysitting in the vein, with someone with a lot of lane pressure. And Gorilla, in this particular lane, basically has to do enough harass with, but through the auto attacks and maxing the Q and doing the max damage to just kind of open up space for prey to farm. Because in, in sustained poke wars, you have to give it to Captain Jack and Che. Yeah, definitely. Well, also the uh, the passive changes to the mantra as well, those auto attacks and spells reducing the cooldown, meaning that the more R's you get, also a major factor in Karma's presence in the laning phase. So this is a support that probably is going to see more use, not only here in Korea, but around the world. I think it actually is a very interesting pick right now and adds quite a bit. So I look forward to, to seeing more of her, the, but looks like Gorilla really keying in on that first. Jin Air, GBM, gonna find himself <laughs> Dancing around the minions can't chain him when there's something in between him. That was and really the <laughs> that was really cute play. Ring around the rosy was played around that minion backline and meant the wisdom could never enter lane. Was literally waiting for the chains to land before committing to that mid lane gank. Che obviously very aggressive here, looking for any stuns. No turret dive threat just yet. 
No, they're just looking to... Oh, nice, actually waiting out the spell shield right there. That's a lot of damage coming through as there's Bray actually flashing forward. There's another flash from Gorilla. First blood to Bray after he lands that cha chain actually get stunned into the wall as Chaser wants to turn this one around. Chilling Smite onto Gorilla. Gorilla may, in fact, bite the dust right here. He will go down inside the brush. But a impressive all-in right there from the Koo Tigers, and that's the power of this route now with Gorilla hitting that chain after the spell shield had gone down. I believe you cannot spell shield after the chain has already hit. It's one of those weird interactions where you go for that late spell shield. It didn't block anything and then just got DPS down. Smart, aggressive use of both the heal and flash to chase. So very nice play from Prey. Vayne Karma doesn't sound like a synergistic lane, but they already have this advantage. And when you bring and innovate a new champion like Gorilla has done with this Karma, people just aren't as experienced playing against You don't see a lot of Karma in solo queue. That might change, but when you bring something that's a bit different, you can get not necessarily cheese kills, but you just get people out of their comfort zone and snowball lane that really has no business winning. Yeah, I, I too am surprised that this lane was able to pick up that early solo kill, and I do think that you're right. It's a factor that Captain Jack just doesn't have that same comfort of Karma's abilities and Karma's new kit and the changes to it that have gone down. I think right now it's probably very easy to miscalculate the frequency with which the mantra is up these days and then therefore underestimate the damage output and the crowd control output. There's a cue to clear out the wave right now. and. One thing that Karma is great at, too, is providing some wave clear for this vein in the early game. It really is helping Prey CS as we see uh, Gorilla go through and use those abilities. So, I see that so far. On a super simple level, it's great to see Koot innovating again. You mentioned during picks and bans, Kuro was the one who innovated the Victor picks, and of course drew Victor bans very early in the season. Uh, last season, again, drawing Victor bans now. They were also the Juggermore innovators. Now bring out a support pick that's just recently been changed, literally just enabled 5.10 this week in the Korean seed and showing us something different and so far been very effective. Let's actually go back a long way. When Sivir was first in the meta, when Sivir was first an auto pick because of the power of her ultimate, one of the first initial counter picks was support karma to give movement speed to just lessen the impact of the on the hunt. And that fact hasn't changed. Yeah, definitely hasn't and will be a major factor in terms of how the Koo Tigers can play out the late game and kite the very dangerous composition that the Jin Air Green Wings are fielding here. So, GBM and Kuro just going at it in the mid lane. Not a lot of kill pressure for a LeBlanc against a Lulu, of course. You try and all in that and you just get the wild growth and that's about it. Uh, Chaser is sweeping across right now, making his presence known on that mid side. Not a lot of deep wards in yet for Jin Air. Meanwhile, Wisdom just took a trip through the enemy jungle to get some vision. Kuro just happy to farm up at the moment. Quietly, Smeb has accrued quite a CS lead in the top side, actually. It's not the 40 of last game, but as you mentioned, 18 CS. That's the power of Smeb. First in solo queue two days ago. Now I believe sixth, so just it's such so, so close in the rankings. It feels like just one win is enough to catapult you up three or four spots if you're in that top ten. I, I can't remember the last time that I saw a Korean solo queue this competitive uh, among the pro players, like the pro players, because of course they are also having a lot of scrims every day, so they don't frequently have enough time as even some of their bench players to get up into those upper ranks of solo queue. But right now, it is just loaded, the top 50, with pro players. And I really think this is uh, them reacting to the increasingly competitive scene here in Korea. They're gearing up for the end of the world and the world championships, really wanting to do well in this summer season. And it seems like people have on an individual level, really doubled down since the spring. And despite growing to those 10 teams, you accurately point out that the, the scene's also gotten more competitive in terms of bottom teams like Samsung, who were basically looked at as free wins and padding stats last season, putting out more of a fight, not necessarily picking up the wins, but at least forcing more three-game series. The three-game series, much more common in summer than it was in spring. And that's important because it matters, the margin of victory, when we talk about points, these are critical tiebreakers that could occur that could mean the difference between going to the playoffs and having to sit out for a long off season. Vayne been very competitive in CS, the early kill and just the lane presence that Karma's bought. 
bringing really high lane presence poke champion with no sustain with a with a weak laner often is a big risk but when it pays off the high risk high reward, reward decision at least has as it looks at right now when karma support is still a very new pick is helping prey stay on even keel with captain jack and this is again really important because ku looking for that scaling so for them to get the first blood and even a little bit of an advantage and to go even in terms of cs is quite good for them this early in the game now Janair may be aiming to make some sort of play around the dragon right here but no they're just going to back off chaser was there to provide coverage while ku actually well uh Right, sorry, That's I lost okay. my train of thought right there. I mean, Jinna has the comp that makes you think they're going to monopolize Dragon. They have yes. Rumble, Rek'Sai, Lulu, Siva. That's so much early power, Annie for the big tip is engaged. You think the vision would also extend this thought, but the vision around Dragon is very much monopolized by Ku. They're the ones that have had the pressure in the air. They have three pink wards in a triangle around Dragon and their buffs. For a team comp that's looking to take things early and not want to drag this in late when we're going to see a super tank in Malka that they have no answer for in the Gen S lineup and just a hyper carry like Vayne. To play so passively around this dragon seems like just a big surprise to me. Yeah, definitely. And they have to start pushing forward right now and making an aggressive play. Lots of people loading up. TP coming into the bottom side. Jay gets locked up with that root immediately stapled to the wall and he's going to die very quickly, Smeb on the flank, just providing some interference on the side right now. This should be a dragon in favor of the Ku Tigers as Che gets absolutely destroyed. A little bit too far forward right there. Looks like they want to tower first. How much of an advantage can the Tigers get out of this situation? I see Lulu aggressively pushing into mid, but not going to be able to pick up that turret anytime soon. Jinna keeps picking proactive comps and then playing reactionary. Did not pick up a dragon with a very similar comp last game. Looks like they're not going to be in with a shot of this first dragon either. Why not look for the late game with a more late game oriented comp if you're not confident enough to take the fights in the early game? Yeah, they're not going to give up their mid lane turret either. Gorilla and Kuro peeling off the dragon just a little bit early to provide some presence in the mid lane and they'll clear up the minion wave and that's it. So tower, kill. Dragon all going in favor of the Ku Tigers right now. Jin Air has to get this top and mid turret soon. They did do some good chip damage, but they need to convert it into gold to make that worthwhile. Standing gold is so important when your power spikes are early. You need that gold instantly so you have the extra ruby crystal, the extra finished recipe into a big item. Because if you're just sitting on component parts and aren't even able to take advantage of the comp that you've picked, You'll be sitting in the late game, you'll be GBM last game where you're 3-0-4 and watching your team fall apart. There's always the reality that GBM could not die this whole series and his team could lose 2-0. Well, welcome to Jin Air. <laughs> That's what I got for you, Bobby Smithy. I'm used to seeing this. You will learn. You will learn in time. <laughs> maybe that's why they go to the Yasuo as the world. Maybe Echo will be one of their favorite picks when that's enabled next week because you just can't pick like this and play passively. What are you waiting for? Because the late game, Maokai, Vayne, it should tell you that the late game is not your friend. No, it's not. And again, we talked about the necessity of grouping first around these objectives with the composition that Jinair has and the importance of controlling the vision because at the heart right now of this composition is the fact that it is a pick comp. You use the Lulu and the, liver, the Sivir speed with the Annie to create a pick before you fight. Smeb just gonna tank this turret right now. Ku committing to the top side while Captain Jack was slowly pushing up that bottom wave. He got a CS advantage and he will trade turret. So actually due to the long wait time when Ku was trying to set the trap in the top side, this actually resulted in an advantage for the Jinair Green Wings. It was a, a smart play. They bought some time to really engineer a nice CS advantage on Jack and trade turret for turret. Hey, look, they get a small advantage, but they're not looking for small advantage. They need big advantages. You can see from the Leandries completed by Trace, already going for a very strong equalizer focus build. If they build items like this with big immediate power that don't necessarily set them up to do, say, backline diving, instead of finishing Leandries, you could pick up the Seeker's Arm Guard and work towards the Zonius, for example. You could just get your Sorcerer's Shoes and have double magic penetration, do more damage with your other abilities. If you're going to commit to an equalizer focus build, surely that has to be parlayed into fighting at a dragon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, time's running out.
for Jin Air. They need, need, need to move on to this next dragon and see if they can pull it out. Meanwhile, Ku Tigers very comfortable at the moment. Got that Blade of the Ruin King. First core items coming down for them right now. Smeb just happy to put off purchasing that earlier Righteous Glory in favor of a Spectrus Cowl. And who can blame him? The better he can do in lane right now, if he's going to be matching up against that Rumble, the more of an advantage he can take. Exactly. He doesn't even need to build for team fights because he's just building for lane and crushing the lane anyway. And they have a Karma. So the speed boost just not as necessary this game because they get that from other places. Jack up in front right now. Now there are a lot of Jin Air players. Gorilla going to have to use that speed boost, but he gets caught by the Timbers and taken out. Great play. Jinair very decisively going all in. Trace on the other side of the map. Smeb getting burned down here by this rumble. It looks like he will be able to get out, but another tower for Jinair. Ku trying to be cute in the top side, and that results in a nice play as they continue rolling through this turret. Jinair starting to take control back of this game. This is exactly what they need. They such crazy turret damage. You can see Captain Jack wailing away. The tip is even being helpful. It means the clumped wave has done so many more autos because the minions haven't been dying. They're actually going for the engage, and Kuro is coming from behind. Bray low. popping his old Wisdom there with the Agony's Embrace. Kuro in from the flank. Captain Jack gets chained and then chained again for the kill. Bray mops it up with an auto attack. Che now trying to get a double stun, does land the W. And Kuro though with one more auto will take out Che as well. So they get the tier two for it. Honestly, probably worth it for Jin Air. They're probably worth it, as you mentioned. It was a good aggressive tip is by Che to get the first pick onto Gorilla, turning that into two turrets. They desperately need that instant gold uh, to get their power spikes rolling. So yeah, I would definitely take it. This yep. should be another turret going yep. down. Suddenly, they're gonna find themselves in a gold. It's very slender, it's only a thousand gold, but with Dragon spawning in a minute, they have the slight lead. They have items, Infinity Edge, Zeal up on Ziva. Even just a crit to any of the frontline members, there's no armor purchase whatsoever on Ku's side. If RNG is in their favor, they could poke them out and finally pick up their first dragon of the series. Yeah, this is going to be a very important fight. Chase, or Trace, rather, his ultimate will be available. So will everyone's on the Jin Air side. So let's see what they can do. They don't have a good setup yet in terms of warding and the bottom wave moving towards Jin Air right now, though that will be cleared out quite quickly by Captain Jack Siver. So a very competitive game this time around. Great moves by Jin Air on the map to seize control once again. Kuro trying to get some free damage, see if he can poke someone out, maybe force the wild growth if he's lucky. Talked about that choke many a time. You do not want to try and clear a ward when the enemy mid laner is an assassin like LeBlanc in that particular area. It's not going to take the bait. Coup, there are, there's a ward, I believe, right on the dragon pit. So yeah, there is right in the back right there. They know there's a ward in front of the dot brush as well, but they're not going to take it out quite yet. They're trying to lay a bit of a trap right there. Gorilla on ward clearing duties at the moment. Chaser has an item advantage. He's actually a sight zone up on his opponent. Has gone for the Sindh Hulk instead of Warriors. So the early damage advantage is there for Wisdom. Crucially, though, Chaser's level 11. In this case, only going to be base stats because ultimate, no combat stats coming through from the Void Rush. Nope. Well, Janair, they need to get a pick, but they don't have the priority on that Dragon right now. Speed Shrine for the Ku Tigers. They may try and make a play on the mid lane, actually. Prey slowly clearing out the bottom side. So Janair says it's time to go for a tier two right now instead. Now, Bray a little bit awkwardly positioned in this fight, even though there's a flank coming in with the teleport. Bray gonna pop his ultimate, and they find Trace big open arc here for Ku. They're trying to finish off, Ooh. and the Tibbers airballs, not hitting anyone at all. Great fight for the Ku Tigers. That's exactly where they wanna be, with Prey starting to split people up on the side. Trace is poked out. Trace has TP, Trace still has Equalizer, and he's gonna get right back into this fight, TPing onto a Rek'Sai tunnel. And the big cooldown is the Equalizer. They're gonna actually start this Dragon. Only one order, they're gonna move quickly. They're looking for the pick on Trace. Yeah, there's the Equalizer, and yeah, that's gonna actually prevent the follow-up. Kuro getting very low, and he nearly gets burned down, but does escape in the end, so... Nice decisive play from the Tigers, collapsing onto a flank with that speed, but it's not gonna be enough GBM is going to, actually Trace gets the kill right there as Kuro has to retreat into the enemy turret. The Tigers are pushed off. 
can Jin Air actually get this dragon? Looks like they will be able to. Yeah, very, very healthy across the board. Literally no one's taking any chip damage, barring a couple of hundred health from Trace. First dragon of the series, so crucial for these Lulu Civicoms that are looking for those outplays with their movement speed. Finally got the pick they needed, and we're able to take this dragon down. So first dragon of the game for Jin Air. Really good equalizer, too, from Trace. Knowing that they were trying to play with the Montred E or the Montred speed onto the flank uh, of Jin Air and then being decisive about clogging a choke so he could just stand there in melee range of that LeBlanc and toaster with the flame spitter. So Jin Air doing a good job this game of coming back. Still, they don't have the lead they're gonna need to take it to the late game here. They have to keep on this trajectory. To be fair to Jin Air, they played team fights very similar in the last game. They tried to back away to advantageous terrain for the Rumble to fight on with the equalizer, those narrow chokes. They just, just weren't taking the bait. This time you're on the LeBlanc, you hit the chains, you feel like you're gonna have burst potential, but you're just surprised by the Leandri Sorcerer's Shoes damage. So that time it was Ku initiating and getting punished for it. Will they keep doing that? Because the trend in the first game was no. They did not take the bait in that first game and it paid off handsomely. But still, first dragon of the series is a crucial factor for Jin Air. Definitely is, and Kuro still a little bit low on the damage side too, this early on, especially with some Aegis's coming out on both sides. So he's gonna need a little bit more if he wants to get that burst onto Trace's Rumble, as we may have some split pushing going down right here. Smet finally getting some armor as well to help deal with this Sivir and the strength that Captain Jack has so far in this game. It's definitely not the SMED that was 50 CS up. It's been a lot closer. Just cleared awards, uh, waves, so now up to 20 CS. But it's been hovering around the 10 CS advantage when they've both been in lane. So that's much more in the favor of this Rumble being able to actually take advantage of his natural mid-game power spike. And look at this, just traps being laid all over the map trying to convince Jin Air to walk into either Prey and Gorilla or Wisdom and Kuro. They want to get that big pick and then push down some turrets right now. They still haven't been able to crack the tier one in the mid lane. But Jin Air has such wonderful wards around their blue side and moving towards the red side jungle of Ku. It'll be kind of an unforced error to walk anywhere where they didn't have vision. They have so many camps and of course minions to pick up in lane that there's no incentive for them to go to their red side jungles. So look, if they keep fighting around the areas they have vision in, they have the warding totems, they have this double side stone. Just follow your vision over that really aggressive flash tip instantly kills Bray, and that should be a turret. And that's how you play this composition. Use that Sivirol, use the Whimsy and the hard CC to take somebody out, and then immediately transition into an objective. They're after Smeb next. Smeb gonna flash the wall, and GBM wrapping around the side right here, chilling Smite. Will it be enough? Gorilla there to give him the protection, but Chaser with the knockup. And that'll be a dead tree taken down with the equalizer there to provide a little zone to make sure they get the kill. So two picks back to back for Jin Air, and they're starting to pull away. And Ku got surprised by the fact that they could take such an aggressive route through the enemy jungle, because of course they'd already taken down those two out of towers. They could cut through the red buff side of the jungle rather than necessarily having to go the safe route because they had already taken out the turret. So smart movements from Jin Air, moving around their wards. Speaking of wards, Gorilla spotted out in one, but the recalls have to come through from the other members of Jin Air. And there have been so many attempted traps from Ku this game, trying to hide in brushes, trying to get those picks. But Jin Air has been playing cautiously. They've been playing around their vision, not taking risks in dark sides of the map. So without that, the Tigers just haven't been there. They're gonna respond right now up the mid lane with the tower, and that'll get them to within about 2,000 gold right now. Of course, late game advantage is there, so not too big of a deal to be this far behind. Ooh. Che could have had, well, he doesn't have Tibbers up right now, but a little bit dangerous for Ku to be standing there. Wisdom slinking through the enemy jungle. In general, being grouped by Ku is not a good thing. They have a lot of speed coming out from uh, the Karma. In general, their position should be Smeb at the front looking for that twisted advance and just don't group those threats because two three-man Tibbers with the massive burst damage that Captain Jack can put out just on the Sivir's natural kit. It's burst that Jin Air have a plenty, so stay away from the group. <laughs> well, if they can find that pick, though, off of one of these brushes, then they're going to be in a very good position 
But yeah, stay, it, it is dangerous because even that ward, if Che is the one warding, he could just hit R instantly and catch you out. So pretty risky. It's uh, kind of who can burst who first. And there we go, Chilling Smite. Gorilla has to flash. Chaser forcing that summoner. Now, they did set up the wave. Smeb in the top side, so that's a slow push that he developed. Trying to use their wave control again to provide them with a victory. The Ku Tigers, exceptional in that department. 50 seconds left until Dragon for once. Ku does not have vision around the edge. Completely dark vision around the dragon. It's pretty neutral in general, only just now some Jin Air wards coming down, but Ku, who've monopolized dragons, I believe it was uh, five and one is the dragon score overall in this series. Looking around Baron, they don't crucially have the likes of Cassiopeia Vein, so they do not have super Baron damage. Still gonna be very fast, but it's not quite the immediate threat of blue buff Cassiopeia leaving vision. Suddenly Baron could be done at any moment. Well, still the Vein is on the team though, and it is 26 minutes into the game. And there we go, there is the speed boost. They want to chase down Chaser, but he's going to escape with his tunnel. Uh, that was not too much used, just to get that down right now. And Ku is delaying this dragon by threatening the Baron. They don't really want to fight. They just want Jin Air to have to play around their decisions as opposed to getting that dragon. And we've seen this bait from Ku. They did this in the last game too. Force them at the Baron force them to try and face check or be concerned. You're doing it, and there we go. There is a vein ultimate right there. Jack gonna pop his ult immediately. GBM finds himself right in the mix, though, and Ku will respond with a pick of their own. Smeb coming in from the flank, and this should be a dragon. It's a really smart, uh, just separation of their engage options there. Smeb on one side of the brush, the rest of the team on the other. Siva caught out. GBM's the one that ends up falling. So they're gonna take the second dragon making Jin Air play reactionary when they have the later game power spike and Jin Air have the early game power spike. The fact that they can make this work is masterful by Ku. And this is, the, again, their strength. We saw them do this already tonight. Yeah. When the dragon's coming up, when they feel that they don't necessarily have the power spike or the advantage, they will make the enemy team respect their ability to do Baron with this vein, and then get that control, which Jin Air really isn't looking for. They were the ones setting up for Dragon right there, and they forced this decision where, well, if we use the vision we have, then maybe we lose Baron. So now we're forced to go in and check out this Baron buff in a very dark, scary place. When Ku has a lot of pick options, they have the speed as well. They have an invisible jungler, and they have a LeBlanc who can blow you up over a wall. So that threat alone forces Jin Air to make hasty decisions misposition and then Ku strikes and gets the dragon anyway. They don't want the Baron right now, but that is really good job of Ku Tigers forcing a bad decision on their opponents. And what can Jin Air do, really? Yeah, they're thinking a few moves ahead is what Ku are doing, which is a sign of one of these top teams. It's something that teams like I Am have really struggled with, but Ku making it work this game. And it, honestly, both of us have taken shots at, pick, at teams over picking champions like Vayne. Cassiopeia, one of the reasons she's so popular, she has a lot of Baron threat. The one thing you can say about Vayne, okay, short range, not the best at turret sieging. Very good at taking down Baron. So just one of those two, enough the threat, but the Flash Tibbers. Yeah, Flash Tibbers. Jay wants this. He's got a melt in the front line. Good equalizer, though. Kuro uh, is on the outside. He's already had his shadow popped right there. Smeb just doing some zoning work. Chaser coming back in. Gorilla looking for that tether onto the jungler. Has to break it. Wisdom running out of the fight. Kuro. Oh, very low distortion away, and that will be a one-for-one one trade. However, Jin Air is still very healthy. There's the flash forward. Captain Jack going aggressive. He gets the double kill on the prey, and they're still committing to this. Gorilla caught out for a triple. Smeb has to flash the dragon wall. Now, can Jin Air turn this into a Baron? Chaser tried to delay Smeb. Arcane Smash, now Smeb needs to get back, and he has to be able to use his teleport right here. Chaser can't win this 1v1 but he can delay enough for his team to perhaps do the Baron. It looks like they're being indecisive. GBM just walked away oh, from it. Oh, this is so dangerous. LeBlanc is back to full HP. Can come over the wall. Still a lot of HP, though, All for Jin Air. available as well. 5,000 health TP, is the TP Baron. TP coming in. Guro on the flank right now. Can he get it? Can he do something? No. The Baron taken by the time Smeb gets there. Jin Air pulling it out, and a stun from Che. There will be a kill. Captain Jack running up as well. Tossing out a boomerang blade. Smeb should be able to get away. Already used his righteous glory. There's a slow. 
And he's going to W to an awkward minion wave. And then back on to Trace right here. They want to go in, actually. Prey can't really do much at all. Wisdom pops the locket, but there's just not enough people right now as Jack gets another double. Captain Jack slicing through these low armor, low health members. Very squishy outside of the Maokai. Is this cool lineup? They're going to take this turret. They took down the Baron with an assertive move. This is the sort of play that we saw SKTT1 play when they did use this sort of comp, and they're doing their best impression here. It's working out. Yeah, make those picks before 30 minutes. Try and get that gold lead. Try and get those objectives. And Jin Air now with a 6K gold advantage. GBM returning to his Medjai's Lulu roots, 11 stacks. Coming for that item and up to 692, it would appear. 682, 682. according to my monitors. There are some more monitors, as you often mention. What does 682 AP mean? Well, she has a five second, 98% steroid, I believe, <laughs> in the movement speed. You know, I've talked to you many times about how I feel about Whimsy. It's obviously the cornerstone of the Juggermore previously. You activate that ability. Siva gets her first auto, activates the fleet of foot passive as well. You're going to be really damn quick, quick around the rift. Yep. And that's what we're seeing right now. So Ku, uh, a little bit, little bit too late to actually make a play at that Baron. Good delay by Chaser, getting that's his team the objective. And now they're on the defensive with not the world's best wave clear. And Captain Jack is absolutely massive. Speeding along at 618 MS, casually. <laughs> and now Jin Air are looking to close out this game. Eyes on the tier two. Smeb push out the top side, but they have no way to defend outside of their base right now. Ku Tigers falling back, see what they can do. But Jack just waltzing up to Kuro getting an auto attack off, has so many shields as well. Not a lot of concern. They're gonna spot Rek'Sai in the top lanes, and maybe there's that small window to get a really fast assertive pick, but those have completely eluded Kuro this game. One, two, and two on the LeBlanc. First round pick of the LeBlanc on the red side. But, you know, very defensive mid laner in Lulu that plays to GBM strength. Mentioned 27 KDA on this champion and always been a strong Lulu player. We weren't convinced that Jin Air Green Wings would pull off this comp, and after how they played an early Power Spike comp last game, I don't think anyone could blame us. The addition of the Lulu and the Annie for the assertive engage has given them so much more this game. Yeah, definitely has. And now they should have a relatively easy time finishing off these inhibitor turrets. Nobody up to help with Chaser. Baron no longer on the side of Jin Air, though. Chaser just able to free hit, no one being sent to deal with him. Of course, Smeb doesn't have teleport, and the Void Rush is available. Now you can see the turret damage being done. Bottom lane, about 30% health left on the turret. The poke, it's still strong from Trace, on to Trace, but half health, they're still going to be able to continue the siege. Yeah, no real big threats. And they're just going to pull off and do a dragon. This is smart by Jin Air. They have what they want. They have control of this game. And they don't have a great composition for diving right here. There's, no, there's nobody to tank the turrets. The only person building armor is the Warden's Mail that's been completed on Chaser. So turret diving, difficult. You could argue that the Wild Growth might be used to turret dive. It'll be at least a large health pool. Chaser caught out stealing red, but uh, if that's the one advantage that Ku can wrestle back, they'll accept that of your Jin Air. Yeah. And now Jin Air right back to it. No actual movement to recall right now, but have Ku been caught with their pants down? There's no one here to defend. Captain Jack making a lot of headway. That's going to be the turret going down, and no follow-up engage from Ku. They blow the Righteous Glory. Righteous Glory used. Actually, they're on the hunt used as well, but they've gotten their objective. They were able to back away. They've broken the base. That's the key factor here for the Jin Air Green Wings. The minions actually spot out and stop the backs, but GBM <laughs> happy to just stack up that AP. Are we going to see another 1,000 AP game? Maybe not the game going to be going long enough for it, but he's threatening it with the build that he's going. Yeah, I'm very impressed. I didn't think this was something a comp that the Jin Air Green Wings would be likely to run ever. In spite of their previous Lulu play, this just didn't seem to suit their style, considering that when we talk about Jin Air, it's usually much more of a patient, uh, poking, disengage style that we see from them, not a pick-oriented, heavy, all-in style. So fun to see them do so well with it. And Jack definitely performing in terms of his positioning here in this game. 
Drew a lot of his plaudits in history for his Sivir players, Spell Shields, his use of cleanse, and those sort of abilities. Been a traditionally strong champion. Prey caught out, chilling smite, but not quite enough to catch that vein. Gorilla gonna help him get out of harm's way right there. Did have to use his blade active though, so that's one less tool for self-peel that he has in the late game. Do not have a pink ward on their flank. Can Wisdom pull off a huge flank? He's in a wonderful position to do so, but they need to be so specific with their target selection here, if you're the Ku Tigers. Yeah, and there is Trace. They see him now, I believe, on the side. Difficult to tell, actually, whether he was, I think he, yeah, he was seen right there. So he has to retreat back into his base, and this is a much more preferential position for Jin Air that just wants only one direction, only one vector of engage to deal with. They just want the single pick. They're happy to fight the 5v4. The 5v5 team fights could be difficult. They don't have the best backline damage. Prey and Captain Jack actually dueling. Captain Jack so low. Flash Tibbers. And Prey's not going to go down. The QSS will save him, but a boomerang blade. Hits him in the back line. Ku Tiger still going in right there. A lot of damage. Trace getting low, but Captain Jack huge right now. Wild growth and running forward for the triple kill. And that should be it for this one. They still have a lot of tower damage available. The Blanc, crucially, is at full health, so they might be enough to harangue them away from the uh, Nexus turrets. Four members, the Rumble can choose to teleport back in, or they could choose the safe route. Jeanette, they have all the options this game. Yeah, I think they should just power through right now. They have the minion waves. There's the, probably could have waited longer to TP onto a turret target right there, but Trace still moving forward with those home guard boots, and that's going to be Jin Air on the Nexus as they send us to a game three. Very decisive play from Jin Air. And credit to Jin Air playing a comp that we weren't necessarily immediately convinced by, especially given their previous playstyle coup. Staying with much the same, but just outthought by Jin Air. They changed their playstyle, the Lulu in particular, and the speed just got them the picks they needed to take over the mid game. And Lulu too, actually. GBM building a QSS that game, it got some magic resist, and that made him able to position better for Captain Jack. Captain Jack doing a lot that game, 10 kills for his team, but that's how this composition should work. That's where all the kills should be going. You need to make that Sivir strong so she can maximize her damage. But just justifying uh, the, the Lulu pick with stacking AP and then just being there to speed up Captain Jack. It's good that they're able to put together a comp like this and win. And Jin Air making this a series of I feel like there will be an adaptation. I don't think we'll see a rise, but there's always that potential. Well, we may see the same bands. Jin Air reprising their role on the blue side this game. Varus, Victor, and Gragas were their bands in game one, and they're sticking to the script. Callista, once again taken out by Ku. And same with the Alistair. So, Ku Tigers also going with the same bands. We assume that Rise will be last. The question is, is the Gragas still a band priority here from Jenner? Jenner, I mean, Chaser could be playing that Gragas, is another good Gragas player. So there's always that potential. It feels like one of those would be left up if it's not banned away on the blue side. In fact, yes, they just go for the Cassiopeia ban. A bit of a nothing ban, Cassiopeia and Azir have both been sneaking through. In fact, Azir not uh, selected any time so far. Tonight, Rise is the last ban. Gragas is the notable champion that's available, but Rumble priority has been going up. They've played two games of Rek'Sai already. Do they go for one of the tried and true, or do they go something different with the Gragas? I think they should take the Gragas right here. That is Wisdom's best champion, but instead, the priority goes to the Rumble. Trace has been playing way more games this season on Rumble than anything else, and they think that's the key. And there's the Sivir takeaway, the Gragas lock-in coming through as well. So finally, the Ku Tigers picking away at the tools that Jin Air has wanted to use, not only tonight, but over the course of this season. And I worry that Ku has actually put them to the sword a little bit with these two picks. Firstly, you lock in the Sivir. Suddenly, you're going to have the extra movement speed to be able to try and get away from the Equalizer. Sivir, very good against the Rumble. And then you have the Gragas for potentially just disengaging. So I, I don't mind those two picks. And it feels like Rumble might struggle to have quite the same impact that Trace had last game. The problem here, Papa Smithy, is that no one's really afraid of Prey's Sivir this season. So that could present some difficulties. Prey needs to up his positioning. GBM going to be the one with the LeBlanc this game. Rek'Sai selected by Chaser. Yep, so goes with the, the Rek'Sai that has been tried and true so far. Both series have been on that Rek'Sai. LeBlanc blind pick from GBM. Obviously one of his champions, but blind pick LeBlancs haven't been working out so much recently. Well, it's interesting too because 
They, the LeBlanc, now Jennera was the one to pick the Lissandra into it. And I, Kuro is a Lissandra player. And Kuzan actually did pretty well against that LeBlanc, but he's going to go for his Kassadin instead. So Kuro, 2-0, I believe an 18 KDA on Kassadin, right up there with his 22 KDA of Varus as one of the strongest champions. It's a very good laning matchup. You just pick up the Flask, that's his trade with the Q, maybe put a couple of extra levels in the Null Sphere, then return to Max in the E, and you've got the Siva Annie duo. This is what EDG love to run. Turbo Annie, great pick pressure. Yeah, and the Kassadin as well. That is a huge backline threat that the Koo Tigers are running right now. Jack is going to opt into something probably with a little bit more mobility to save his hide right now, but still a squishy composition. Jay, thinking about that Nautilus adding a bit more beef to the front line. They're going to need it. It's probably going to be a Maokai last pick. That's the champion that really sticks out. Once again, returns that Rumble versus Maokai matchup. And Spev's been winning that every game so far, so why wouldn't you go back to that? Exactly. There's and no reason not to. The Grog is too, capable of that disruption, isolating a target, and that isolation can continue with the Chain CC from the Twisted Advance. Okay, we're doing this again. All right, it's not quite the Karma support to run with it, but the return to the Riven from Smed. This is the champion that's propelled him to that top ranking. Loves to play the Riven in solo queue especially, but 2-0 in competitive play on it this season. It's a champion that Rumble cannot deal with the split push in the late game. So suddenly, you've got a split push threat of not just the Kassadin, but the Riven with Teleport as well. Well, this is going to open up a lot for Kuro as well, because you can't shut down the Kassadin while you're worried about the Riven solo killing your Rumble. So Chase are going to have to pay extra special attention to the top side, which will give Kuro a lot more freedom to actually farm up for the late game. In the meantime, though, that kill pressure with Sivir Annie on the bottom lane, huge for the Koo Tigers. Wisdom has a lot of freedom. Does he go for the top gank? Does he play down to his bottom side instead? They've got the kill pressure in both of those lanes, so it's up to Chaser to really play a strong counter jungling game, a counter ganking game this time around to try and shut down the big time pressure that Wisdom is going to have. They could have three losing lanes and have the pressure of a Grog, a strong ganking jungler. Chaser is gonna have to have a second sense, earn his paycheck today to be in the right spot at the right time because there's risks in every lane. Yeah, very dangerous situation. If Jyn'Air can get through the laning phase, though, maybe they can pull it out. But the Koo Tigers have really shown that they know how to play this Riven. This is their go-to pick when times get tough. Let's see if Smeb can do it and make it 3-0. Genera fans. Still winning out in the volume battle today. Koo fans so timid. They should have a lot to be confident about. I really like the comp they put together. I was remarking on their game two comp from their 2-0 win against KT Rolster earlier. That was Riven Gragast, Varus Corky Karma. So it was a different identity. It was double AD. But they have the Gragas here once again. I love Gragas with these single target burst assassination style champions like the Riven. In a team fight, if you get that cask in the right spot, split up a couple of the threats on the Jyn Air side, you've got both Kassin and Riven to dive in and do instant damage, even execution damage coming through from Riven. Usually you kind of think binarily about a champion like Riven. Oh boy, Trace getting caught out a little bit there. But you think of her as a split pusher. You think, okay, in the late game, split pushing, happily going to run over the Rumble. That's going to be something that uh, Jyn'Air have to rely on or have to respond to. But team fights have never been Riven's forte. Moving towards the tier map build, you get any semblance of a flank on this Riven. Combine that with the Gragas, just the instant burst to take down the likes of the LeBlanc or the Corky in the back line. 5v4 fight. Very easy to clean up an unorganized fight, and that's what the Explosive Cast CC provides. And even just the Annie Tib is engaged. Instant engage or is instant disruption, depending on whether Annie and Gragas is getting things going, and that should allow Riven and Kassadin to shine. Yeah, indeed. And when we talk about Smeb's Riven as well, is the lane swap going to come through? So they want to try and shut this down early on, make sure that Smeb doesn't really grow to be a threat in a 1v1. Still have to be cautious though, because when you want when you lane swap against this Annie, 
all of a sudden the Annie ends up in a lot of other lanes early on the map. You don't want to give that Cassidy an early kill and set him ahead. So there is an element of risk to this as Smeb continues to go through the jungle. Also, Smeb, 6-1 and all-time professionally on this ribbon. Back when he played on Incredible Miracle, he even sometimes upset major teams with this pick. It has been his ace in the hole, and he thinks that he could do it again tonight. And what better time to pick it up in what is a very important game for both teams. We noted it in the standings. Jinna actually second at the moment. We question the level of opposition that they've played against. Credit to them. They're 1-1 one and one against the resurging Koo Tigers, but the Koo lineup it's an impressive one that they've put together. They've got, it's got the coup flavor. You've got kind of the specific picks. We saw the Karma last game. We're seeing the Riven here as well. They execute on these pocket picks so well. 2-0 Karma, 6-1, and one, as you mentioned, lifetime on the Riven. And what I love, Papa, is uh, right now the meta is so broad and there are so many viable champions that we're really seeing a lot of team identities in terms of pocket picks develop, particularly in Korea, where, of course, Faker is doing some wacky stuff in the mid lane, but I think Jin Air tries with that Zareth. I don't think it's that successful. I don't think it's a good pick right now. But I do think that situationally picks like this Riven that we're seeing from Smeb can be pretty excellent. And it gives it gives more of a flavor to each team to have some pocket picks, whether that's going to be something like a Jace from Coco or this Riven from Smeb. There's a, there's a lot going around right now. It's a unique factor of League of Legends with the three-band system. It's hard to count for those pocket picks and also keep the meta champions in check. We already speculated that Rise being added to the must-ban pool would open up champions like Callista. And although we haven't seen her today, if you know that it's the threat of a champion like Riven, who can overtake what is the most popular champion in the meta right now, Rumble first picked this game, and the Riven having a very good early and late game laning, basically 1v1 matchup against that champion, you can't account for all the variables in the band pool, and that's why, as you mentioned, having a backup pick like the Riven that you're so practiced upon, it's just another dimension to the Koo Tigers as we get more and more towards the business end of the season. Yeah, very exciting stuff. Well, we did see an early recall from Che right there to hop into the bottom lane, wanting to keep that Annie nice and bottled up in this lane swap. Smart move. They have also been able to break any kind of freeze, pushing it all the way into the turret. So we're seeing some Pretty even, uh, even farm right now between our top laners. And also, just the Corky in the lane swap, such a powerful champion in terms of levels. The faster you can get that level six, the better off you're going to be at Corky. You kind of skip one of his weaker parts of the game, and they can move right into barraging an enemy with those rockets and having a lot more success, uh, as opposed to Sivir, who's going to see that success early on. Prey being cute right there, actually blocking the cannon minion kill with a spell shield on the harpoon. And Koki's always been seen as a champion who scales with levels, as you mentioned. Obviously has his item timings. Trinity Force, a bit different to the three item power spikes that other AD carries need to do relevant damage, but his one item power spike and his laning super powerful. Now Wisdom is caught in the mid lane. GBM, they're waiting to see a distortion used before they actually go in for the kill. I don't know if GBM's gonna do that though. He definitely doesn't have to in order to clear this wave. Crow's low on mana as well, has maybe one burst of spells, but no more than that. Of course, Rift won't, not available just yet. And Wisdom probably smart to back away. Yeah, I think that's when you go right there. There's no really reason for GBM to start clearing that wave, considering it was pushing towards the enemy right now, unless he wants to push it forward and make a base run. But Che and Chaser will be seen on a ward. They are not going to find much on this Cassidy in the early game, just taking a little roam up to the mid lane. Meanwhile, Gorilla, Starting to make his own move right here. See where he goes. If he's going to join up with Wisdom and attempt to get some deep wards in. The Corky a little bit vulnerable in the top side right now, but they do have a ward in the river. And Wisdom has gone for this uh, jungled item straight into the uh, Sidestone. Hasn't gone to try and finish the Cinderhawk. Of course, combat stuff's not going to be there, but very strong lanes in general now. There's a big gang coming in the top side. Now, they know Ooh, there's a ward out. there, but they're still going to go for it anyway. Gorilla has the stun loaded. Captain Jack just going to Valk out. Yeah, I think a low percentage chance of that popping through just because of the ward being down, but I really like going for this Sidestone early. You might think, okay, it's going to hurt his clear a little bit. You're not going to build into Cinderhawk. We know how strong a duelist Gragas is. Okay. Not really going to be able to duel against Chaser when you're going for the utility of the Sightstone. But we've already mentioned, Riven should naturally outlane a Rumble. Cassidy, especially with levels, 
will go at least equal with a LeBlanc, and you really like the Siva Annie Duo on the bottom lane. If you can relieve pressure with wards, that's probably more important for Wisdom than actually trying to impact with ganks or kill pressure. Yeah, definitely right now, because when they have such good all-in lanes as it is, if you open up the possibility of the all-in with the Riven, if you make Smeb comfortable to really pull the trigger, that could be powerful in and of itself. Jin Air wants this early dragon right now. No one really around to do it. They do see Captain Jack there. They know it's going down, but there's just no response from Prey, who's running back to lane. Wisdom cautiously checking a brush. They're gonna be too late, and Chaser will just hop right underneath that wall and get out. So free early dragon for Jin Air. Actually, their first, first dragon of the night, I believe. And it was just all off the back. Of course, we had the lane swap in top. It was a Corky versus a Riven matchup. And that top lane, the item timings were at a different point. Went back, bought a Shin and a Longsword. Knew that Prey had gone back to pick up his BF, so the timing was very clear in that regard. And just rushed down the Dragon. So just good understandings by Jin Air. Finally having the first shot with the Dragon. They still have those early power spikes. They're still looking for very much an objective-focused early game. And this time, finally, living up to their win conditions a bit more clearly than they have in the first two games of the series. Not to mention that Trace uh, gets enough money for that arm guard before he actually has to lane against Smeb. So. Arm guard versus Hex Drinker, definitely both building for lane. We're looking at a 1v1. Of course, Blade of the Exile not activated by Smeb. Half health, I thought he might have gone for it, but the minions must have been the big consideration. They didn't want to fight in the minion way. Yeah, a large number of caster minions, so it comes with its own fair share of risks. Uh, calmly clear them out instead. Trace knows that a possible retaliation all-in could have been coming if he sticks around, so he will just go back to base, shop a little bit more, get a little bit more HP, and then catch this wave once it pushes forward. So smart, smart lading from Trace right here. I really like the timings that we're seeing. Uh, it's working out beautifully for Jin Air. They, it is they, they get the lane swap up until Jack hits six, up until the Sheen, up until there's uh, money for Trace to go back by the arm guard, and then they swap back, get control of the bottom side, get the dragon. So very methodical play from Jin Air so far. They're doing everything they, they needed to in this early game. The big question still remains, 25, 30 minutes into the game, Who's in the lane against the Riven with uh, Teleport? Who is the person they can send? They have two options uniquely when you have Rek'Sai. Rek'Sai can potentially be the one that you send to Swift Push. Can Rek'Sai get the item? Certainly not going to get Snowball in the early game, but something needs to be done to comp okay. around the fact of the Riven split. This is something that Smeb loves to do is contest these early objectives. Now it's the three-man group. Chase is there, but no one else. And LeBlanc is reacting slowly. Easy blue steel from under the nose is in fact a warded brush by the Jeanette. So they punished Trace going back right there. They knew Equalizer still wasn't up even though he had gotten back into lane and he didn't have pressure. So that's actually a very smart blue steel right there. Just a little bit of trading. No all in. Even though Che, or Gorilla rather, is waiting in the wings right now on a pink ward with that Annie. He wants the kill. He's just going to hop back off instead. It's like they will detect that with the uh-oh, what's going on over here on the side? Rek'Sai finds Annie, and Gorilla needs to flash out of that one. They saw Annie coming in with the Tremor Sense and went for the attack quickly, burning Gorilla down to 50% HP, and that's going to make those ganks a lot less powerful now with no flash. And blowing in the flash of an Annie is honestly one of the biggest wins you can have against that champion. There's almost an argument to be made to just dying. Of course, in this particular game for first blood, it's not relevant, but in the late game, if you don't have flash up, your engage potential is so much lower, you almost have to be a secondary gauge or just react to a backline dive. It makes you so much less strong. Has already invested 800 gold of the very low early income into roaming, and suddenly now roaming's not really an option for three minutes. Well, at the very least, though, now that Wisdom is seven, the any flash is going to be less of a big deal. Sure. They do have another form of primary engage with this composition uh, to balance that out a little bit. Smeb just keeps on farming his way forward in this top side. And now Kuro just starting to play a little bit more defensively. But yeah, that blue that blue buff contest was so well done by Ku. Playing around the cooldown timers, playing around the pressure. And that was all a result of what happened in the top lane when Trace dropped his ultimate. So this is a very technical game so far. Both teams doing a good job of reacting to each other's cooldowns, to each other's compositions. Really nice lane ward coming through, spotting out Wisdom. This is a ward that you often see on the other side 
of the bottom lane, but just smart to see any semblance of a lane gank. Of course, with the displacement that comes through from the Gragas ultimate, the flash uh, explosive cast is always a risk. So very nice adaptive play coming through from, I believe, Captain Jack. It looked like a trinket war. All right, well, Prey and Gorilla starting to get control as we tick ever closer to this next dragon in 90 seconds time. And I'm not sure that Ku's really going to be able to commit to this. I think the smartest thing they could do right now is try to snowball Riven's gold by getting her that tower kill, concentrating some of the gold from a turret while she auto attacks it down and then move into the late game from there because right now Jin Air is in a really good place to contest this dragon. They have all the power they could want, really. The question is, how much do you give up if you're Ku? You're against LeBlanc Rumble. You don't have much ward control around the dragon. It follows that the stats that the second dragon provides aren't a big deal. So maybe you go for the push, but it opens up that win condition. Suddenly the third dragon's a must contest. So your play in six minutes is super predictable. Do you get enough out of just leaving Riven to equalize in CS? Because if they can remove dragon as a win condition, maybe pick up the next two themselves, suddenly the split push should overtake the game. But if you give it up, it's again, it's always a game of inches. You're always talking about what can you get out of these strategic decisions. There is a team fight around Dragon that Ku win. They do have some item timings that make it possible. In fact, Bloodthirster from Siva. If that says one thing, it's either you want to take down <laughs> turrets or you want to disregard the burn damage of the Equalizer. Yeah, and that Bloodthirster, we've seen it come up more frequently on Sivers who really want to have that stronger uh, power spike around this point in the game. Just saying that, hey, we can tank this turret down if we have to. Uh, we can deal with some more of the burst. There's a shield to deal with the Corky Rockets and the poke coming in at the Dragon, so it is a more early game focused play. But that's okay. They know this Kassadin and this Riven are going to be very strong in the late game. So you can take that risk. You can take that shot early on and just try and smooth out your power curve. And in general, Siv is a champion who fights with her tanks, more in the front line than necessarily at the back line like a vein. So she's probably going to take equalizer damage. She's probably going to take a rotation of spells from LeBlanc, even if it's just a mimic distortion. So having that extra lifesteal, the 20%, I believe 23%, of course you have to include the Doran Blade in that yeah. calculation, you can uh, disregard a lot of damage. You have an auto attack reset. You get an instant burst of 150 health or so with the ricochet. I don't mind it as a build. As you mentioned, when you literally have carry threats in top and mid. Yeah. Oh, and uh, the fact that they don't have a tank line too, definitely playing into it. So it's like a little bit of a gank coming in. Chaser wants that tunnel over the wall. Can they follow up too? Prey and Gorilla moving, inching closer. Gorilla's flash about five seconds away. There might be a really small timing, but the longer the wait, the more likely it'll be up. Well, it's there up it now. is. Yeah. There it is. So they're not going to go for it in the end. Crab in Ku's court right now. You've got that speed shrine. Dragon is live. But no one really wants to commit to that play quite yet. Captain Jack awkwardly laning with Trinity Force. Obviously would much rather have someone rotate bot with strong wave clear and just move to the mid lane and try and power down this turret because doing a decent amount of AD damage. So we'll be able to try and push the castle out of lane, but forced to be accountable. That's what Siva does. You can never leave her free time with your turrets because she'll just push them down. And look, missing out on a power spike like taking out turrets with Corky, it was a very relevant thing on patch 5.5. May not be so relevant here. Big thing to me, Jin Air really need to secure this second dragon. Yeah, and Kuro finds a little bit of time to eliminate a pink ward. One less tool to get that vision around the pit. Actually, there's a lot of wards going down right now no in favor of Kuro. Chaser is just on the opposite side of the map, so he clears out two pinks for free. Wow, two greens down as well. Ku really reclaiming this dragon pit. It sounds like weird for you to get so excited about that's what ward I get, That's what I get and excited about. And exactly, this is this is our purview, is that they should not have been able to get away with removing, what, 250 gold worth of vision for free when this is a primary win condition from Jin Air. You need to be fighting tooth and nail for this dragon, and they're just giving it up. And they can't see that it's even going down right now. That's been pulled out of the pit, and there's no vision, so Wisdom might actually be able to solo this. That is a very clever little dragon attempt coming in from the Tigers. They've got it. They should have it here. 550 health takes it down. Cool. I didn't even know that really was possible. Really nice sneak right there. And if we just look at the pink ward, the placement right there, it was 
that is a placement that can where they know that if there is a ward within that radius, just slightly to the left of the opening of the pit, then they would be able to see it. But if there's a ward just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, you can pull the dragon in there. That is so cute. That is an awesome little trick from Jid Air. And double analyst, and we both learned something today, Monte Cristo, <laughs> in our that first was series. Either. So that there was you really go. Cool. That's something to learn. If you're looking to sneak out those dragons with the Cinder Hulk completed, obviously you could just disregard the damage. It was a slow dragon, but they prepped it so well, they cleared out all the pink wards around and there was no risk. So low risk, high reward, good play by Koo. Yeah. I and that's what gets me that's what gets me. Low proper. risk, high reward. Oh yeah. I'm I'm surprised <laughs> that you let them get away with the Riven Top. <laughs> I like the Riven Top with this team just because of how strong Smeb is on it. And I do see the value here in terms of the split push in the late game. So I like it also, with the Also, I also like it with the Annie. I mean, sure. you land that big Tibbers and all of a sudden there's broken wings and an ultimate in your face. Anything that helps a Riven get in melee range before using any of your abilities yep. is what? 1,500 damage in an AOE that you just really have hard times. Oh, Jay actually getting caught right there. Big stun going down. That'll be a disengage. Jay going to get out. Kuro on the run. And meanwhile, Gorilla trying to escape from GBM. But there's the kill. First blood actually comes through for our Kassadin player, Kuro. Smeb finds himself in the mix after a teleport and a flash. Trace now, he's an exile on the run. Escape from prison. Running away from Kassadin is uh, always a tough thing to do. Or oh, also Moby very Boots maneuverable. Annie. Yeah, he's... Uh, He's on a suicide mission right now, but can he actually make it? There's just a flash. A flash. He's going to do it. He got it. <laughs> what a boss. <laughs> and he blew a flash. He traded flashes with the jungle. And this is a champion like Gragas who you sometimes need that flash to be able to set up the peak, uh, the peak uh, potential of the explosive cast. So not a bad trade at all. Riven's caught out. Chains missed. Do they have enough CC? I don't think so. Yeah, Riven speed right now. He did get the mini stun off onto Chaser to get him in front. And now he's just going to pop forward with the shield. Nice escape there. Good escapes from both sides. There was a window there, remember. A little bit of movement speed removed from Riven. Didn't even have boots. So there was a small chance of the chase. In this case, it's probably more valid than most chases for a Riven, but it's I not know. quite possible. That Gragas and Henny coming back give you a little bit of pause. The, they know Gorilla has the early Mobies. And that turnaround is very real from Riven also. If you, if you give that Riven a little bit of CC, he's got the Tiamat. He can get that big uh, just splash of damage onto you with the active. It's only been a splash of action this game in general, Monte Cristo. Two dragons, no turrets, and one kill. It's been a very even early game, and we're going to be really incentivized to give the advantage to Koo in that regard with Kassin and Riven. Really looking uh -oh, for both threats. Prey. Prey is going to get dived. Yeah, there's the ignite onto Prey. He's got a flash out of this one, but that's going to be oh, not very great useful. Spell shield. Oh, Picks he up the actually kill. kills Jay underneath the turret right there. Buys himself enough time to trade one for one. Now, Kuro. Coming in with the Rift Walk, looks like he's not going to be able to turn this around. No mana at the moment. Had to use three Rift Walks and the Flash, just hopefully get in range, wow. but what a that play spell from shield. Bray. Really good, and they're going to find more. Wisdom has to use his ult just to disengage. GBM nearly landing those chains, but Gorilla on the side right now. They can't re-engage this, and now Chaser in enemy territory. Smeb there once again. Dash, stun, knock up, dead. And Smeb will get his first kill. They actually almost chased down Captain Jack as well. Credit to Prey. We've really singled him out for criticism about his positioning in a lot of games, but really played that turret dive well. In a 3v1 scenario to pick up a trade of kills, excellent play. <laughs> I thought he was just dead to rights. Now Trace, going to get a turret out of this, but so will Koo in the bottom lane. Both teams trading cross-map objectives, but Smeb is just going to town on the mid lane at the moment. Not quite going to get it. The Riptide from Che will be useful for clearing out that minion wave. Gets a bunch of damage down, though. Prey apparently needs some small raptors right now. Smeb says, that's mine, damn it. Doesn't have any life still. Maybe just wants to pick up the Hydra soon to just have a bit more staying power in lane. Cassidy. Only about a minute and a half. I saw it. 23.09, I believe, is going to be the 10-stack World of Ages. That was a very fast snowball rod that's going to be powering up very soon. The Riven split push threat's already going to be pretty much complete at this point. Rumble's got some, uh, got some armor, but uh, nowhere near enough to deal with the Riven. Yeah, this is for Jyn Air. 
their composition, the Corky, not going to be the most synergistic pick with the LeBlanc. So, yes, you've got some good poke damage. Uh, if you could poke somebody down, have GBM maybe finish them off from a flank. But it's more specific. It's more technical to try and pull this one off than it was in the last game, I feel. Magic damage aplenty also. Rumble, yeah. LeBlanc, Corky, all going to be primarily magic damage. just done for Wisdom already. Yeah, so the fact I was going to parlay it to is it's a very early Aegis. It's going to answer a lot of the early base magic damage values. Of course, Captain Jack building into the Blade of the Ruin King, so we'll have some consistent AD and will need that active just to hover hope in hell of peeling away Riven. Yeah, well, Trace also just not that strong yet. Had to itemize for armor and no needlessly large rod in sight so he doesn't have that big burst from an early game rumble that we can sometimes see and that we have seen the past couple games from Trace considering he went for a very fast Leandries in the last two. I think you have two schools of thought. You either completely ignore the armor, as you see Corey take a nice burst from the LeBlanc, but shrug it off mostly because of the Abyssal Scepter. Trace has teleport, of course, has equalizer available. Dragon's getting low, 2,000 health. They Doesn't look like Jenna know what to do. Nope, they're not decisive enough right there. And there is Che getting nailed by a Tibbers. Chains onto Tibbers, only rooting the bear. And Smeb now is heading into the mid lane. Did use his ultimate right there, moving forward through this minion wave, getting that great wave clear down. But that'll be a kill and a dragon as the Tigers abuse Jenner's attempt right there to push in and get some more damage down afterwards. They're going to get a turret on top of that. Equalizer down, but is there going to be enough follow-up? Looks like no. Yeah, tower will be saved, though. It saves the tower. They don't have a lot of range damage. Only Sivir when we're talking about a range champion in this lineup, especially when Annie was completely chunked out. So hard to finish off that tower. They're going to go trade in the, in, the, in, in the end, but... Honestly, it feels like this series has gone with the team that's playing Assertive. In the first game it was, of course, the Koo Tigers, and then we saw excellent Assertive picks from the Annie. Suddenly the Koo Tigers, they return the Assertive, they take down the Dragon, they get the Engage onto Che. Whichever team has been looking for the picks has been the team translating that into map advantages. Yeah, big time win there for the Tigers, and again, they're able just to get black out that vision, set up a pick as well as Jinair was filing through that choke point, and then GBM also couldn't get a root there at the end of the battle, instead just hitting the Tibbers instead. So there really wasn't that much of a possibility of a turnaround. Now Trace has that Zonia's Hourglass, though, so he at least will be a bigger front line, maybe able to dodge some of the burst and turn things around. Smeb getting real scary, though. Hydra now completed. He's moving towards that last Whisper. And the big difference between this game and game two, of course, the Annie has changed sides. You see the Nautilus is the replacement on the Jyn Air side. I think people, you know, they, think, they see Nautilus and are, all right, depth charge, that's an engage tool. But I think what we reliably see is that Annie Flash Tib is excellent engage. It's an instant cast. There's so little counterplay against it. The Nautilus depth charge, it's so predictable. No. It's slow path that you can flash safely. Yeah, it just, you can't compare the two. No, not at all. Smeb on the run right now. Will they try and dive him? Dangerous. Depth charge goes down on him. There's the follow-up equalizer. Smeb going to dash out of it. There's a knock-up stun. And Smeb just going to go down four people on the bottom side, however. And that's going to be a barren attempt right now. Trace comes in. No equalizer. He used it. There's the Sivir. Turn around. Force the flash. Stun on a Trace. Turn it around. Go back to the Baron. Will they? No. But that is a good response from the Tigers. Just punishing them for that attempt on the bottom side of the map, and now they're gonna get a turret over it. Captain Jack making his way to equalize on the bottom side. Looks like it's gonna be traded for the outer mid lanes. You definitely take the outer mid lane over the top lane, unless you're really looking for Baron Vision, which might be a big consideration. Does the push stop? Because Koo in Vision clearly pushing down. In fact, it's a two for one trade Smeb in has turrets. TP. You definitely don't stop if you're the Koo Tigers right now. You can keep on pushing forward and actually win these trades. There's the TP coming into the tier two. So decisive play right there from the Koo Tigers. Are they going to get the tier two? Looks like we had potential recalls. Nicely done by Koo using the TP advantage that they had because they knew Trace had just gone up to the Baron. So let's try and work out exactly what these teams have got with the turret trade because it is a two for two turret trade. Now, all three turrets the in the Baron, Baron area. Ridiculous. Exactly. That's the big thing that Kua picked up is Baron control. In fact, Jyn Air aren't even coming in this area. Finally, Che wards the closest brush. Do they have enough damage to rush it down? It's only at 5,000 health. Their Baron damage isn't that great. And all of Jyn Air are coming. 
And there we go, equalizer down on the ground already. GBM gets stunned and destroyed. Gorilla showing up with a big stun, and now it's follow-up time. Trace is just there to get annihilated after his Zonias. Gorilla, no Tibbers for that fight, but catches GBM on his distortion in. Ku Tigers with the aggressive move, taking out all those turrets to provide any semblance of vision around the Baron area has opened up these picks. It's all off the back of understanding what they've gotten. They had gotten all the turrets around Baron, so Baron Rush became a much more realistic objective. If you look at what Jin Air picked up in the trade, they have all the turrets around Dragon the Enemy Blue. But Ku, the first team to set up around what they'd previously established, not a minion wave, side minion wave in this case, it's the turrets being taken down. Get the two picks. Okay, not the Baron, but still playing around the advantages they created for themselves. Right, and Ku again, just they're demonstrating that very strong shot calling that we saw from them throughout this series and throughout these last few games uh, that they've played after their relatively slow start right here, Smeb, still having a big impact, very threatening in that bottom side. Will they send three people? Now, this didn't end well for them before. They're going to open up another bear. I don't know why Janair is doing this. They've got a few people on that side. Smeb may be able to burst somebody down right here. LeBlanc is on the bottom side, and he's going to die. But at what cost? You can only assume that they do not respect the Baron damage pressure from Ku to be able to do this. They're going to have Rek'Sai's Gorilla good. Gorilla has Tibbers. There's almost no way they can stop this Baron. They're going to wait to see the gates. 1,100 health. They're in there. Chase is close. Isn't able to get the smite. Falls down first. And Ku's going to run rampant. Wow, really bizarre call there from Jin Air going for that kill again. They trade one for one. Now, Equalizer. can they clean up? It's like it's not going to be enough. They're going to get slowed by the barrel roll. And honestly, Kurosh just look tasty here, then Rift walk away. Obviously, they're not going to have the way to lock down. GBM's going for the pick, gets it onto Wisdom. They should have the damage to take him down, although not quite yet. Captain Jack joining late. Kuro, he's tanky, but not tanky enough. Wow, so they get the picks, and a lot of that was the Ku Tigers just not running. They actually committed to that skirmish a little bit too much, particularly Kuro right there. So in the end, only one Baron buff actually coming out of that. Still a net gold win for the Ku Tigers. It's really peculiar play from Kuro. Didn't have the Zonias complete. You can see now in his infantry just the, the parts of his Zonias. Yeah, you can't, you can't walk into that. You you already took the advantage that you had. You saw three people bottom side, and even though they had the Rek'Sai, you could still just burn down that dragon, and, or the Baron, take it, and then get out of there. If Wisdom has to die, Wisdom has to die. No reason Kuro does to. And the item build doesn't really lend to the play either. Doesn't have any CDR, so four seconds was the cooldown on that Rift Warp. Jenna have a four-man, five-man stack even, in fact, around the dunks. They'll take it down easily. They'll keep it up all even two for two. The Baron comes down, but it seems like it's going to be a net neutral between these two teams. Well, you only need the one Baron buff to make a strong push. And we'll see how much the Tigers want to go for that. So yeah, Kuro right here. Now they burst GBM down early, but GBM just isn't killed by the Ricochet. And going back in, Captain Jack just gets an insane shred on him, just walking straight into that range. And now we see Smeb and Trace Dueling it out, Gorilla with the Tibbers drop, and goodbye, Trace. You cannot live through this one. The uh, cast is thrown out for a celebration, just throwing a bit of the uh, the drink out for everyone to enjoy. Not sure what Wisdom was thinking. They're not living up to his name at all, but they'll, they'll even pick up the red buff. I mean, there was no flash either from Trace, so there was zero chance of him actually escaping that to the degree that Trace not even dropping his equalizer, just accepting his death. But you know, everyone needs a little bit of victory champagne, don't they? Clearly. Congrats on a successful gank. Right, it's his Gorilla. own homebrew shared with everyone. <laughs> I wouldn't want homebrewed champagne. That that doesn't sound great. <laughs> Probably can't call it champagne either. You can't, unless you were in the champagne region of France. I mean, Grog is a classy guy. He probably <laughs> does own property around that area. It would be homebrew sparkling wine. It's actually a fact for you. As, as a, a great lover of, of fine fine wine and liquors myself, you can only call it champagne if it's made in that specific region of France. And knowing your love of, of the Gin Air Green Wings, you might even pop a bottle if they win here today. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Meantime, we will see a, just a little bit of a siege here under the turret. Gin Air, a little bit scared of going in on this one. The Baron buff, as you mentioned, is the big equalizer. You look at this cool lineup, it's not threatening under turrets. They only have the Sivir as a ranged damage dealer, and he as well to some degree, but you would have thought there'd be some engage, but the engage 
We've mentioned it's a bit lacking. If you miss those chains, Chaser doesn't get the really aggressive flash into the unburrow. They kind of just have to be voyeurs and watch. Yeah, the main the main engage is going to be that that rumble ultimate, so that there is some sort of follow up from either a uh, a nautilus assault. And we were talking about this earlier. You were saying that the big thing is the instant cast, and that's so true. You cannot really use nautilus alt as a primary engage because there's just too much counterplay. You can flash and drag it away from your team to get back into the back line where you're knocked up, no one else is, and you're not CC'd in a meaningful position where there's follow up damage. The best way to use the Nautilus ultimate is to get the primary engage down, start working on their front line, and you, what you want to do is hopefully knock up their front line after you target a carry, but you want their carry to run around in circles while you kill their tanks. That's how you want to use it. It's basically just a delaying tool so that the AD carry or the mid laner can't deal damage while that spell is going. And if you're going to use it for engagement, as you mentioned, not an ideal thing to do, I kind of think about it in the same way I do Malphite Ultimate. Despite the fact that Malphite has that big, unstoppable force initiate, how often do we see players flash to get rid of the cast time? If you're doing a melee range depth charge, we see when Callista, for example, is evolved, Fate's Call into instant cast depth charge is a really big one. But if you can get into melee range, yeah, that's true. it is effectively instant cast. But from range, if you're just throwing it at an AD, it's a zoning tool more than an initiation tool. Definitely. We've seen some of those big uh, either Callista Nautilus ults or even Flash Nautilus ults if you have that really good positioning, but it's hard to rely on that for He's engage. very slow. He has the lowest base move speed in the game. Obviously a huge model size. It's very hard to surprise people with Nautilus. <laughs> Not really his, his forte as a champion, but... Uh, Look, he's really popular, he's a strong, solid laner, he's very good to gank for, because of course multiple types will be four types of CC, but engage, definitely not his strong suit. Well, here we go, after all our monologuing about Nautilus ult as an engage tool, we do see the split push closing in. Smep does have some more magic resist right now, opting for the Maw of Malmordius as his next item, and GBM not gonna get too much damage onto a Riven right there with that Maw available in the shield as well, so he's gonna pop over the wall. They've got some ward clearing to do. They want this to legitimately threaten this next Baron. Still a lot of Jyn Air wards in their blue side jungle. It's a big gold lead. We haven't really talked about the gold this game. It's about 8,000 gold lead coming through for the Ku Tigers. You have to think a lot of it gonna be on the Riven, 103 CS. This is what develops. It was very even throughout the first 10, 15, uh, 15 minutes of the game, but uh, it just comes to the point where you can't enter lane against the Riven if you're Rumble. And the, the look at the level difference. Level 15 to level 18 Riven. Yeah, that is that is a massive, massive difference. And reflected in the CS totals as well. Yeah, and just... that's because Trace has had to be grouped with the rest of his team. Uh, instead of just laning right there, there's going to be a Righteous Glory. Gorilla will not find the engage that he's looking for. And they have to back off after that, maybe let it reset a little bit here. Still 30 seconds until the Baron, so they have a bit of time to consolidate their position around that objective. And Jin Air can use the wards they already have down to actually start clearing pretty nicely. They just want to equalize vision as much as possible, ensure that none of the implied pressure of having all the turrets down in the area is enough for the Ku Tigers to sneak another Baron buff. Minion Wave pushing quite aggressively into the bottom lane, but no real rush to clear that out. Yeah, they get this crab though, Jenner. So they at least have tons of wards, tons of vision around that Baron. And a very good job of just blanketing the area so that they know what's coming up next. Probably the dragon will be the next goal though for Ku. They've got a couple of options. They can solo it with Sibur. They can solo with Smeb quite easily while still clearing out around the Baron. Yeah, with Lifesteal especially, and just spamming that shield won't even take any real semblance of damage. Actually has a Chain Vest purchase, can only assume G Guardian A. Angel is gonna be the pickup to be just even more of a frontline diver. Potentially you get some sort of flank engage coming through, and yep, our predictions are correct. Little to no risk picking up this dragon. Yeah, that's the clear that you wanna do right there. You have the, actually I'm surprised Wisdom is down on that side already. That's somebody who can't get back to the other side of the map instantly via teleport. Surprising you used his smite as well. I guess with the Ranger's Trailblazer, you don't necessarily have the combat stats to work up, to worry about in that situation, but smited away, that's the third dragon. Suddenly, even easier to pick up these picks, but in all the moves we were talking about, the, uh, not a Talisman Ascension, but of course, the Righteous Glory, the Silver Ultimate, they have a lot of speed to potentially get that first pick and then rush down that Baron. Yeah, so I'm gonna get hit by a chain, but again, 
GBM just not doing very much damage. He doesn't even have a Void Staff yet. Still working on that item. He hasn't been able to pick up the kills to really round out his build, even at 36 minutes into this game. This is a build where if you get face checked, sure, you'll do a lot of damage. But when you're trying to make things happen, it's oh so difficult for GBM to make much happen in this game. They've the got the two exclusive vision. Man. Two wow, pink wards, and look at that, men. even faking with the glory right there, like there was somebody in that brush. They denied the vision. What a great play from the Koo Tigers. They're going to lock up a Baron. So what happened right there is we see the re-engage coming around. Smep oh, sprinting Kuro forward, but Kuro gets poked out pretty darn hard. Are we going to see the counter engage? Smep actually pulled down there, gets hit by that equalizer and by uh, the Nautilus ultimate, but it's just not enough. Prey popping over the wall, trying to get the autos down. Smeb on a rampage through the enemy team, though. But Chaser moving forward. Has he gone too far? The answer is yes. Triple, Triple kill. kill for Smeb. Quadra kill. Is that going to be the Penta? Kill. It will be the Riven Penta, and Smeb will lock up the first Penta kill of this season. Wonderful kiting from Smeb, able to use all his dashes so judiciously for both damage and survival. Massive minion wave. Prepped earlier, now the Baron buff as well. And with 20 seconds left, we're gonna actually see the replay as a lot of this game starts to end, but what play from Smeb. And Jenner rightfully thinking they should re-engage. They got Cassidy and Lowe. This is their chance to come back into this game. And we're gonna watch the end of the game instead. No Penta kill replay for you. Not yet, anyway. Until the MVP, which Smeb will no doubtedly achieve. Wow. Well, Koo Tigers putting an exclamation point on that win with a ribbon pentakill to win the series 2-1. to one. And you might be able to get Smeb away from the top of solo queue rank, but you can't get him away from the ribbon, apparently. <laughs> Even in competitive play, this team makes it work. Now 7-1 uh, in Overall, his career, 3-0 yeah. oh this season. Making Riven work on a patch like 5.10, throwing Cinder Hulk out the window, and a big carry performance from Smeb, justifying all that extra CS, all the extra levels. Level 18 Riven rolled that fight. Yeah, very nice. A tough loss for Jin Air, but they made it closer than I thought they were going to, actually playing very well throughout the early game. But the mind games, I love what the Koo Tigers do. That righteous glory. The righteous glory in the mid lane. We didn't even have a chance to talk about it. Blowing that on the two-man Baron, just to make it look like they were going for the pick. Let's take a look at this pentakill again. So this fight actually looked really, really even. Smeb was caught out, started to fall yep. over. Riven has a lot of lives still in this build. At about 30% health at this point, but look at the group fits and wait for the re-engage. Yeah, Prey also, Smeb just cut, getting the double oh, stun the and damage. then execute onto the LeBlanc at the end right there. You can't, Jenner did a good job of setting up that fight, it's true, but Smeb just so far ahead and Jack left with nowhere to go besides a Valk, and then carving his way through the Jin Air team for a Penta. And there he goes, Smeb. Have some fun with all the Corsair gear you just won. Head back.